Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And we have a special guest here tonight, uh, stemming from Jazz Oz Games, one Mr. Jason Smith, the developer of the highly anticipated game Cultic, a 90s style retro first person shooter in the vein of legendary titles such as Blood. Mr. Jason Smith, how are you doing today? Oh, I am not doing too badly. How about yourself? I'm on vacation, so I am doing fan fucking tastic, my, my dear sir. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I just had a vacation a couple weeks ago myself. First one since like before COVID. So I oh, know the feeling. I get the feeling we were both due. I had the uh, <laughs> dubious luck of being considered an essential worker. So I haven't had any time off requested or otherwise uh, that wasn't you know mandated by government fiat. So yeah. Yeah. It comes with its advantages, but it does have some problems there. So anyway, enough talking about my neck of the woods. How are you doing in yours? Um, good. You know, we're uh, in the heat, so I'm enjoying that a little bit. Okay. Um, but otherwise, just working on trying to get a little swing, get back into the swing of working on Cultic after after my vacation, which was uh, which was weird. That was like the first week that I haven't worked on the game in like all of my spare time since um, probably January when I started working on it. Yeah. Well, speaking of your game, how did you get into this whole game development business? Um, so I've been doing, I've been dabbling in game dev since I was probably, oh gosh, like in fifth grade or so. Um, I remember, uh, it actually actually started more so, I guess, with animation. I always, I've always wanted to get into animation. And I remember one day at school, um, some, some kid in well, some upperclassmen had like put together a PowerPoint to show the underclassmen. I don't even remember what it was about. Um, but I remember being like, oh my God, I didn't know PowerPoint could do that. I knew it was a program that was on my dad's computer, but I didn't know you could like kind of like animate with it. Um, and so I started like making little animations in PowerPoint by setting the slide transition time to like a 10th of a second, um, which obviously it's not designed to do. Yeah, it's um, a little bit I, choppy at that point. Yeah, and then I got my hands on Flash and started doing a little proper animation. And then very quickly, um, a friend of mine introduced me to Game Maker 5 is the version that that was on at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I just started making just terrible sprite games, just like whatever sprites I could get my hands on, um, especially anything like Super Metroid or Metal Slug related were kind of my, my jams at nice. the time. Um, and just started putting together. I mean, they were terrible but you know you gotta start somewhere uh, and that just kind of continued eventually I, I figured out how to like export flash animations um as like sprite sheets basically and started to do some of my own sprites um and then in 2016 i think yeah 2016 i finally got into like 3d game development so i had never touched modeling or a proper game engine before then or anything like that and um then downloaded unity and started learning blender and and, and here we are, you know, five years later. So it's been it's been a road. Yeah, I think my first kind of brush with video game anything really was recreating Super Mario levels using graph paper when I was a kid, just yep. drawing them on paper and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, so basically, you've been at this for quite some time. This isn't some, you know, hey, I'll just gotta try making my own game for shits and giggles thing. You've actually had a lot of background work to get to where you are today. Yeah, I uh, I wouldn't say that I would say that I've only been doing game development um, in like a serious manner as like a like I, I, I'm going to put together a completed project since maybe 2014 or probably 2015. And I think in 2015 I had um, a short like three month unemployment spell, mm -hmm. um, and I just like really went ham on a couple of games in Game Maker Studio. Um, there's a, a side scroller called Dungeon Break I was working on, and then like a top down survival horror game. And I, I was working on those like really seriously, kind of like doing all my own sprite work and all my own music and all my own sound. And I was just not satisfied with, um, with just 2D games because all of these games I wanted to make would have benefited from being done in 3D, but I didn't know how to do that. Um, so I was like, well, I guess I guess it's probably time to learn. So, so you um, taught yourself essentially. Yeah, uh, I mean, there were a lot of YouTube tutorials along the way, um, and just like learning how to model was the biggest thing because I'd never messed with 3D modeling at all whatsoever. And mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of it's it's really hilarious looking back at some of my earliest 3D models. I keep some of them around whenever I have like friends or or fellow uh, game developers who are um, 
they're like, well, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be good at 3D modeling, so I don't really want to start. And I'm like, oh man, let me show you my first 3D model. You could always have one. Not... You could always have one like printed out and framed to put at your desk. I should honestly, what I should do is I should I should 3D print one of my first 3D models just to have it as a as a reminder. I'll be like, here. I'll, let me give you this desk toy of my first 3D model. And if you can try, if you can guess what it is, then you get <laughs> you get a prize. Because my goodness, they were bad. Yeah. Well, um, at I, first, all 3D models used to be bad. If you look at like uh, PS1 3D sprites versus the, you know, the pinnacle of it, like probably something like uh, Simply the Night, which is, you know, on the same console, but it's 2D sprites and it just looks a thousand times better. They yeah. just, you know, people, the entire industry have, for a certain point had to learn how to do it. And, you know, given the hardware limitations at the time, it wasn't easy. Yeah, no, uh, Symphony of the Night's one of my favorite games. Thanks for bringing know, that up. Right? I'm going to so I'm gonna have to go play that again. Yeah, that was, um, Symphony of the Night was one of the other games I stole. Um, I stole sprites from a lot. Uh, but Symphony of the Night, I will say, like, that's like, a, that's like a higher level of stealing sprites because there's so many frames. And most of the good sprite sheets of that game are just, um, like, data dumps from the PlayStation. <laughs> so you still have to, like, assemble all of it yourself. So that yeah. was... Some of that was really hard work. And then like Alucard's cape, uh, you know, oh, like changes yeah. color. It's like a palleted thing. And so, you know, uh, I like, I remember converting every single Alucard sprite. The one, like the sprite sheet that I had, um, he had the Alucard cape. So it was like in varying shades of red. Oh, yeah. um, and I, I remember grayscaling all of it out so that I could use like Game Maker to colorize it. Um, and that was like a really cool thing for me. Uh, not worth the effort at all whatsoever, but. Well, uh, it was it practice. Was, yeah. Practice is never not worth the effort. That is true there. <laughs> so you spent all that time working on your own and now you're working with 3D Realms. How the hell did that happen? I don't know. I'm still, I still don't really know. Um, I, gosh, this would have been, I started on Coltec at like the very beginning of the year. And I think 3D Realms reached out to me in like February. I should really go and look this up so I can get my story straight. But um, it was like February and then, like the only thing that I had done on Coltic at the time was like, like the lever action, um, the mayor's leg, I had sprited that. And then I had like one, like the axe cultist, the very first iteration mm -hmm. was added in. And I think, and like, and like, I feel like that was it. It was like that starting area with like the pit in the ground and like one gun and a half implemented enemy. And then, uh, you know, and then one morning I get a message from Fred uh on twitter and he's just like hey let's talk and uh and i you know i didn't know who fred was at the time and i just, but i looked at his you know his information i was like oh these guys from 3d realms that's 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 a big deal and uh, but i that's you know, a I, pedigree right there that yeah uh, and, and i i kind of assumed it was just going to it was just going to be like uh like you know they wanted to say that they thought the game looks cool or something like that um but then i you know i hop on a call and it's and it's a handful of people and 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 <laughs> And, uh, you know, they're all on Denmark time. So to make the meeting worked out, I got up at like six in the morning um, and I had to work at eight. Um, so we oh. had this meeting at like 6.30 or seven. And basically, you know, these, you know, th these folks from 3D Realms are like, hey, Coltic looks looks great. And we want to make it a 3D Realms game. And I was like, <laughs> oh, ah, I'm not awake yet. I see what this is. I understand You're half now. expecting the pink elephants to start busting into the room. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And so, and so then, you know, and then I had to go to my day job, which was, I was just like, I couldn't focus at all. Cause it, I mean, it was, it was like, I mean, exciting, but also terrifying. Like uh, the, yeah. The, the imposter syndrome was just like through the roof. It's like, like these, it's, it's one you know, thing to get contacted by a publisher, but it's 3d realms. And when you're talking about making this kind of game, that's the kind of name that really is just like, what? Me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And like on, you know, 3d realms games, I know that, you know, not, not not everybody that's there now worked on the same titles then, but mm -hmm. like you know that these are all the games I played growing up. I mean these are you know the same the same build engine games that contributed to you know where I am now and you know like why I want to to make this game because I played you know like I mean I know Dark Forces isn't a build engine game, but like Dark Forces and Duke Nukem and Shadow Warrior and Blood I played on my you know on my dad's old computer all the time when I was a kid, um, and so it was like I've I've been wanting to make cultic um like this this game this storyline um for a very long time like i have had this idea kind of in my idea bucket for for years uh like probably since high school but uh which was unfortunately a very long time ago for me um oh, but i <laughs> but i just you know i just i didn't know how to do it and you know i, I looked into 
like 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 doom and, and build modding to try to like maybe make it my own but it didn't really feel it didn't feel right and i you know i i wasn't smart enough to learn those systems either at the time yeah. and uh and so the, you know this is a I've and I've tried to make Cultic a few times too. Like when I first when I first started getting into three D modeling, I was like, "This is it! Like this is these are the tools that I need to make this game that I really want to make." And then I like made the first the first Mauser C ninety six in Blender, and it was bad. It was <laughs> it was a bad model, a bad well, bad model. You know what they say? You have a thousand bad Mausers inside yourself. You just have to get them all out before you get to the good one. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's just like you know, um, you want like I have. That's a new dog. I'm sure probably close the window. Right? Okay. A second. <laughs> she's a cutie, but she's still getting used to the place. All right, that should do the trick. Now, that further ado. Uh, uh, but it, it was like you know, like this this game in my head is is like not only is it you know it's it's inspired by you know these games that are that are gorgeous to look at you know have great, like great art styles and so having a having a half-baked art style just wasn't wasn't going to do it like it needed to be something unique um and so when i when i made that that lever action sprite it was actually for an, a completely different game um it was actually originally so i had been on a big phasmophobia binge and i still okay. do because I, I love that game but i uh i was like man you know it'd be really cool is if there was a game where like you had like the the evidence gathering and the like the detective work of of like phasmophobia but then also with like the hunting aspect and so i was going to make a game where you like like hunted down cryptids like just like uh got dumped into this big open wilderness area and you had like a day phase where you could gather evidence and oh god and cabela's to... bigfoot hunter exactly yeah <laughs> and it's like you, you had a day phase where you could like gather evidence and then figure out what you wanted to bring for the night phase which is when you actually hunted it and like depending on you know however well you did during the day and how much evidence you found would determine you know like how well prepared you were for the night um and so i and but i was like i'm gonna do it in like a ps1 aesthetic because that's like the only real graphical style <laughs> that i was ready to work with at the time and and i made i made this model of the lever action and and then the first the first person rig and i was like well, what, I wonder what it would look like if I converted this to a sprite. Like I've never done like a 3D <laughs> model as a sprite. So I did it for fun. And then I saw how it turned out and I was like, oh man, this is it. Like th this go. is like, like this is the art style that I want to do. And then and then it all, you know, it just it, it, it took off from there. Like all, all of the sprites that I posted in that style were getting pretty good reception on Twitter. And then I was like, well, I have this cultist model that I had made for um, a a previous iteration of this project and so i like loaded him up and like and like improved him a little bit because he looked pretty rough around the edges um and then turned him into a sprite and that's the axe cultist that we you know we know and love today and uh and then that got really good reception too and i'm like i'm gonna put these guys in an engine together and i was like i'm gonna figure out how to you know how to do like a palette in cultic like how do i take what the camera's rendering and and palletize it and and that worked out really well and it was and that just it just it just took off from there and uh and and here we here we are eight nine months later here we with, are uh, with a demo and with realms deep and with and with uh 3d realms supporting me and it's i gotta it, say realms deep, you were one of the big winners of that particular convention because i think uh, from what i've all the response i've seen to you, the trailer and to the you know you talking on that uh, show and the demo itself you sir have gotten a shit ton of very good response yeah it would well it, deserved it too yeah, thank you. It, it really, it honestly blew my mind. Um, like I was watching, I was actually sitting over here on the couch with a bunch of my friends over uh, to watch like the, the trailer drop. And I had it pulled up on the TV on Twitch so we could have the sidebar chat. And I just remember it was so funny, like as soon as the trailer started, and then immediately the chat was just like, is this cultic? Is this cultic? cultic, cultic, cultic. And I was like, there it is. Nice. But, but a lot of people already had that surprise spoiled for them uh, because I of a miscalculation on my part. You accidentally uh, I, released I, the trailer. Well, so I um, I've never released anything on Steam before, and so I was super paranoid about like screwing something up, and the demo wasn't going to download, mm -hmm. and I was terrified that like the trailer was going to drop, and it was going to be like you know demo available now, and then people and would go it would and be available. And, oops, <laughs> oops, the demo is actually not available, um, and so I asked if we could actually drop it Friday morning, like quietly. Just like we'll just we'll just un, you know we'll unload it on Steam. It's not available yet, so it shouldn't show up on like the store page, mm -hmm. and it won't show up, you know. And, and it, so it should be fine. And then and so I did that, and I tested it out. Um, 
and and it was all working great and i was like okay cool and then one of my friends messaged me on on facebook and was like they were like hey congratulations i just saw somebody tweet about cultic and i was like what <laughs> I was like, they're like, is that bad? I'm like, they're not supposed to be tweeting about cultic. And so I go, I was like, send me a link. And so she linked me to the tweet and I was like, oh no. And I was like, it's okay. It was just one guy and, and there wasn't a ton of feedback on it. And then, um, and, and, then, then. Like two, and, and then two other people were like, did you guys see that the cultic demo was out? And those two people had like 50 and 70,000 followers respectively. And I was like, God damn it. You gotta be kidding me. Which, which i mean it was it was it's equal parts like awesome to see and like absolutely organic, terrifying yeah well it was like organic hype to be built up from because i you know we didn't tell anybody that we were releasing it and it's, and it's like so there wasn't an announcement on steam there wasn't an announcement on twitter or anything so like the only way that somebody would have been able to find it would be to like actually log into steam and search for it by name that would be the only way you could find it unless, unless i guess they were like like crawling a steam database like library search kind of thing but uh and then yeah it was and then it was like i we i think i dropped it at like eight in the morning and by noon alpha beta gamer already had a video on it and i was like <laughs> oh god and then so i messaged i was i was messaging with the folks at 3d realms and i was like we like i think it's okay i you know like there's not that many people and then you know the youtube video dropped and i was like oh no we're in trouble like this is <laughs> it's it's out of control and out of, so we decided just to like to just like keep quiet just and like not just, yeah, just we're just not going to say anything about it and then you know we'll just pretend like it didn't happen uh and then to calm my nerves i decided to go out drinking with some friends that night and uh and i had i had a few margaritas and then i i made I tweeted like a picture of like a, an open back door and I was like, Hey, has anybody seen the cultic demo? I think it got out. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, so the, my silence was broken, but, but so it, that was kind of a funny little, uh, happenstance. So it was neat. Cause then there was, you know, cause then like the speculation was stirring. Cause like mm. it was on steam, but also it had, it had 3d realms attached as, as the publisher on steam, like, which is what? something, which is something that we hadn't told anybody about. Exactly. So people were like, wait a second, like, what does this mean? And then, yeah. and then around and then Realm Zeep happened, and yeah, and the reception for that's been crazy. Like the the feedback on the demo has been has been great and super useful, and and it's just like it's like having this big pool of folks to be like, hey, this isn't working, and especially because like I'm one guy with with one computer, so like you know like performance testing and knowing mm -hmm. that ultra wide screen wasn't working properly. Ultra and... wide screen is the bane of so many game devs' existence. Just the exi I know so many people who just hate the moment ultra widescreen gets mentioned just because it means so many screw-ups on everything <laughs> nothing works yeah it was like it was like wide ultra wide wasn't super difficult to implement but the problem was like my my intro uh, cutscene mm -hmm. is like a bunch of 3d objects that are just rendered in real time and they're all just like floating in this black void together um and and it looks great in in 16.9 but then when you expand the horizontal bound suddenly you can see things you aren't supposed to see and so it's just like oh man and so like i got what what is ultra wide like 20 21 9 i got Something that like working that. and then somebody messaged on the forums and they're like what about 32 9 and i was like how big is that monitor <laughs> i think that's the kind of reason like i got three screens here so that's like one screen is going from one into my desktop here all the way around it's like for people who want vr but also want to show off that they have more money than is needed for vr <laughs> yeah so i gotta i gotta see if i and like i'm happy that like i want people to be able to play and enjoy the game so i'm happy to but the problem is i don't own a 32 9 monitor so i don't know if it's working properly or not um and so i'm just like i i can i can try to I can try to put it in there. Unity luckily has a built-in thing for like testing aspect ratios, but um, even that's just in the editor. So if it doesn't work, like, uh, you know, mm. it's, it's the same thing with like Linux and Mac builds. It's like, I, yeah, I can, I can push one out, but I, I can't test it. So I don't know if it's going to work or not. And <laughs> if this was just slide. a game, yeah. if I was, if this was just a game on itch, it would be a little different, but like, I don't yeah. want to push something broken out onto steam. Yeah. So well, there's gotta, enough of that already. Yeah. Some of it being made by AAA publishers. Uh oh, I didn't say it. <laughs> Guilty. All views are mine, especially yours. But in any case, that does bring to mind something I wanted to ask you. You spent a long time, you know, developing by yourself, and now you're working with a moderately big time publisher. What do you say is the major differences for you specifically in terms of how you operate now that you have uh, that actual support level now? Um, so, as far as like the development goes, not a lot has changed. Um, I'm still pretty much doing 
most like all pretty much doing all the development on my own still um like 3d realms has a lot of really talented people on staff but i am a stubborn control freak and i really like everything to be to be to be close to the chest especially like now that the game is just being developed and so like in the future um i would really like to tap into some of those um some of those minds of like, especially like level the like level designers to help me because like the the cultic demo that's the first time i have ever built like a large sprawling level before i mm -hmm. usually do like like arenas or like roguelites where you're doing really small set pieces Mm -hmm. um and so and so there are resources i really want to tap into but like right now um the biggest thing was like was like play testing you know they had a really good testing team uh to help out and uh and then just like uh you know guidance on like social media and um and uh, like help with you know putting stuff together on steam and just like planning things out and so a lot of it's just been less like like support to the development of the game and support of to like Hey, here's how you develop and and like sell and you know market a video game. Yeah, because it's like, like you allowing know, you to concentrate on game development while they take care of all the rest of the stuff, like you know managing all the subsidiary elements to it. Right, which I have zero idea about. You know, the closest I've come to selling a game was taking some donations on an itch game uh, back in like 2017. So um, that's about the extent of my business acumen when it comes to <laughs> to selling game so i mean like my twitter i've just been i just post stuff on twitter that i think people would like to see and that's been doing pretty well for me so far i need oh, to get so back into doing, you, so yeah i need to get back into doing my developer logs too i used to do those on because i really like to to uh you know geek out and talk about all the stuff that's happening on the back end but mm -hmm. it's hard to do that in a twitter post um and yeah. so I, I used to do developer logs pretty uh pretty often and then i stopped uh, uh like in the months leading up to realms deep because we wanted more and more stuff to be like a surprise when the demo yeah. came out and now i'm like i've got all this built up stuff that i want to talk about um so i think i think the the big the big fire update that i'm working on now will probably probably be dev dev log worthy once oh yeah i've seen some of the uh, gifs and videos that you put on your twitter page uh, that molotov is looking really nice yeah, it's it's super fun. Um, I am like all of the I say the all the fire simulations and reworking how the fire works and attaches to things in game is done, which is the easy part. The hard part is how do enemies react to being on fire? Um, and so I just I just did this huge like multi day project of rewriting all of the enemy code so that because like each each enemy previously had like their own distinct script that handled everything about them, and I like went through and figured out everything that everything that's common between enemies like pathfinding and gravity and swimming and yada 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 and put all of that into like like a, a parent class so that when i need to modify things like how does pathfinding work how, do, how does physics work how do It'll they start determine... affecting multiple different elements instead of having to be done one by one by one by right. one which increases right. and... the chances of errors occurring because you're doing the same thing over and over again instead of just one time Right. So now the only things that are affected per enemy are like, you know, the, the axe cultist, you know, he's think, like throwing an axe. He's the only enemy that does that. So he's the only enemy who has that bit of code. Um, and so I think the fire system is going to be a lot easier to implement mm -hmm. now. So I'm really excited to start working on that. Um, yeah. But that's going to be that's going to be a lot of fun because I was like, I wasn't really sure if I was going if I was going to need like a fire element to my game so much. Um, and then I had a binge of playing back through blood again. Um, I, I was playing through, I was playing through death wish actually, finally. I streamed and, uh, the entire, uh, that mod, uh, my Twitch channel a while back a little after finishing the original blood all the way through. Right. God damn, that is good. Isn't it? Death wish is crazy good. But he's still but working it was like, on it. He's still adding yeah, I, more stuff. I'm kind of bummed that I, that I played it. <laughs> now because now now there's going to be you know more to it and i like to play things um all the way through like like as a complete experience I, unless i waited forever for like the resident Evil 4 hd project to be almost done so i could mm. like experience all of it at once but 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 anyway so like i was playing through blood and like i forgot how fun the flare gun was and how fun and so i was like oh god no i'm gonna have to do fire and do it right and so well speaking um, of so, someone who was actually commenting on uh, twitter telling you to put fire in there i can't say i'm unhappy about that <laughs> <laughs> well well speaking of blood you mentioned that how you had a lot of you previously played a lot of the holy build engine trinity back when you were younger so obviously those you know 90s style retro shooters are very much an influence here obviously what other kind of influences in terms of like you know horror and stuff like that would you say have been the most uh, significant for cultic um so i mean yeah as you mentioned as far as like uh, like gameplay and kind of aesthetics go you know like the build engine games were a big inspiration there um of just just like games that are 
really fun to jump into and play and, you know, not need a whole lot of, not need a lot of setup and not need a lot of, uh, you know, like if you, if you put it down for two months, you can come back to it and not be totally lost on it. Yeah. Um, but as far as like other influences, I would say like Resident Evil 4 is a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the elements um, in terms of like, like the pacing and the set and the set pieces and even some of like the enemy designs is very, very inspired by, um, by Resident Evil 4. Um, yeah, I think, I think the lot, Harvester in this case. Yeah, yeah. And well, and yeah, just like the setting and a lot of that stuff is inspired by, um, by Resident Evil 4. And then um, like some of the mechanics and some of the um, some of like the level design stuff also comes from like like Dark Forces 2 is a game I played a lot of. Uh, and I know it was a game that I really I really enjoyed and really enjoyed um, like just just the way the levels flowed together and a lot of the like creative things that you got to do in those levels like uh, like when you're going through like the one of my favorite levels is um, I don't remember the name of the ship, but when you're basically crawling through all the like fuel lines of, of this giant like freighter, like mm-hmm. you sneak into the you sneak into the ship through like the fuel through the refueling system and and you're like having to sneak around, but you have to like watch your blaster fire because if it touches off any of the fuel, oh, then you God. get like then you get like blown to hell. And <laughs> and it's just it's just really cool, just like giant set piece of a level. Um, and it's just stuff like that that I'm like, I want to make levels that are that are that are interesting, but also that feel like real spaces, which is a big focus mm-hmm. of my level design. And also is, a big focus um, of those old build engine games. That was one of the things that made them different from say Doom or you know all those Doom engine games when that they really took a lot of time to create functional places with the build engine, you know, that weren't exactly realistic but felt right. You know, you right. have all those, you know, different uh, uh, porn shops and the Duke Nukem yeah. and various hotels or houses, warehouses, places you could go to. Yeah, and I, I don't. I just feel like, like personally as a gamer, I, I'm able to get more more invested and, and feel more immersed in games where I feel like I'm in a real place. And that was like a big factor in in like I, why I enjoyed um, like Doom 2016 way more than Doom Eternal because like you know like a grounded mm-hmm. realistic feeling space where I'm pulling shotguns off of dead bodies and and yada yada versus as opposed these... to power ups floating in the air and spinning around uh, yeah and well, and just and just like the giant the arena designs you know like mm-hmm. everything's and like and I and I'm not I'm not saying that Doom Eternal is bad I don't want to go down that road but it's just like one of those things that affects my enjoyment of one title versus another and it's like yeah. um and, and that's why I you know like sometimes games that are more like arena shooters are I, I, well <laughs> aesthetically for one thing like the arena thing doesn't do much for immersion i also suck at arena shooters so that's part of why I'm, i don't i don't play them very much so. yeah it probably does have a little bit of an influence i gotta say yeah. though i am grateful to do maternal because it got me to buy a new graphic card which i sorely needed by that point there you go but you know i didn't finish it it's just you know i got to the super gore nest and just like yeah, I'm done. This isn't what I wanted. This isn't the kind of thing I want. I got to, I I, try, I gave Doom Eternal, I think, three separate tries of like setting it down and coming back to it. And mm. one of these days, I think I'll just bite the bullet and put it on the easiest difficulty and try it yeah. again. Um, but I got to, the farthest I got was, there's like a part where there's these like totems that like boost all nearby enemies. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, into, yeah, yeah. And I remember getting, I was like, okay, this makes sense. Totems boost the enemies. The enemies are basically impossible while they're boosted. So, and it's like, yeah, destroy the totems immediately. Okay. Yeah. And, and then it drops you into an arena where the totems are inaccessible. And I was like, uh-oh. Oh, that is <laughs> was, just dickish. And, and it's, there may be something super obvious that I was missing, but I was like, okay, they're behind a wall. I can't get through the wall. I can't get over the wall. And I've got like a hundred souped up imps punching me in the teeth. And I was like, ah, oh. this ain't it. <laughs> I, I am now frustrated. I remember game. the first moment that made me go, uh oh, was when I punched a zombie. The first zombie ran into, I just punched it and it didn't die. Yeah. Yep. Just like, yep. Well, yeah, then. I remember I remember having that having that thought too when you when you first spawn in and uh there's just these shambling little zombies around and you go up and just like clock them in the face with your big doom guy fist and then they just like slap you back and you're like, wait a second, that wasn't supposed to happen. Exactly. And twelve shotgun shells, really? It's just yeah. Well, no. and, that, and that's and that's and that's the thing with Doom Eternal is that it's um in in my opinion it's a game that wants you to play a certain way, right. which is which yes. is which is fine, which is fine. But yeah. that's that's one thing that I it was like uh, I made this uh, I think I made this comparison last time I talked about this, but like uh, it was a like Hitman Absolution. Oh, uh, God, I was really I, I was really. I was really, really stoked to play that game um, because the whole like uh, they marked it as like like a you know like be your own assassin, play your way, blah blah blah. I and then pre-ordered I get... that game, oh. and then you and then I got into the first mission and like 
and I go through and I do I do it my way, which I like to I like to eliminate as many like guards and as many hostiles as I can, so I have more breathing room. And then I've completed the mission, and it's like okay, you completed the mission, but you don't get any upgrade points because you didn't do it the stealthy way. And I'm like, wait a second, you said I could do it however I wanted. Uh, and so, and that, and so that's that's a big driving force of the design yeah. behind the encounters in Cultic is like I like every I try to design every area with like with a lot of cover and a lot of ways that you can you can come into it like you can you can set up you know you can you can put a bunch of bundles of TNT on the ground and you can you know attract a group through a door and then blow them all up you can use objects in the environment to your advantage you can throw barrels around or you can just charge in with a sten and and just pop headshots left and right um, but it's like you've got you've got a pretty large arsenal and all and every gun has its own unique utility of like situations where it works really well mm -hmm. and so and so if you if you enjoy just like using the double barrel and sliding up to enemies to dodge their attacks and then putting both barrels in their nostrils and pulling the trigger that's an option like you can do that and so you know i don't, I don't want i don't want anybody to have to play a certain way and it's like it's which clearly worked very well because the game is set up so that you can play it slow and methodically and the demo takes about like 30 35 minutes to play or within like a day of the demo coming out there's like a 50 speed second runners. speed run and i was like perfect which i mean you, you can spam the dodge key you can slide all you want there's nothing slowing you down from speed runnings but it, i was it was really cool to see that like so quickly like somebody somebody is enjoying cultic enough or is at least interested in it enough to speed run it which is great oh well, there the you next, go yeah the next the next step is somebody enjoying it to put together rule 34 of it so that's, that's i was the next just step. gonna say <laughs> you know you've made it in you know in the internet to fame and glory when someone does that <laughs> exactly yep that's the way it uh, is. and i've been anytime anybody posts any kind of like like fan art or anything of cultic on twitter or in discord i save it immediately i've got a folder going oh, I, it, it, ma course. it makes it makes me so happy i have like hanging up on the wall up here the very first time anybody ever did like fan art of a character i was working on or like a character in one of my games uh i like i got it framed because that's yep that's uh, it, it was it was just so exciting it was like holy Which crap, character was it uh it's the guy from dungeon break he's just like a generic knight character and that game's actually on itch you can play mm -hmm. it it's it's really buggy but it's kind of fun all right i'll but, track down the i'll track down the link and stick it in the description <laughs> oh so speaking of art well the one of the first things i noticed when i was playing uh, the uh, demo for cultic was that intro that you mentioned earlier and you know the way it's done with uh, all these strings attached, like on a cork board, attaching different, you know, articles and stuff like that. I found this is a really, really good, a, um, how should I put this, a really good example of like nonverbal information, you know, given to the viewer without any kind of dialogue or anything like that. It's just, you know, implied storyline that goes all the way from some missing people, detective on the case, gets fired, keeps on the case, finds a lead, goes there, and there's a guy with an axe waiting for him. Mm -hmm. So how long did it take you to get to that particular intro, you know, settled on and, you know, how you went about creating it? Um, so the, the story is very much in, in bits and pieces, right? I'm not much of a writer at all. And so a lot of the storyline is just like, as I go and I'm like, oh man, this would be really cool. Or like, oh, I bet this would be like a really cool like thread. And at some point I should probably sit down and actually write the story out in its entirety. But um, the intro was really just like, half of it is that I do, I really want to do hands-off storytelling. Like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't plan to have a lot of cut scenes that you have to sit through. I don't plan to have a whole lot of audio logs that you, you know, you have to listen to. And yeah. so like, if well, you know, traditionally I for those nineties, you know, shooters, that is pretty much the baseline. You had maybe a little bit of story at the start and maybe at the end of each episode and so that, and the beginning of the next right. one, and then, you know, maybe cut scene at the end of the, at the end when you beat the, the game and that's about it. Right. Well, I mean, there is lore behind the cultists and what they're doing and like how the and how these creatures you're going to fight are created. And like that's all decided on. And I, re and I really want to flesh that out as much as I can for people who are interested. But I also understand that there's going to be folks who who do not care about the story. And I don't want to force them to sit through it either. Um, and so it was like, how do I put together a story? Like, how do how do I put together an intro that A, does the hands off storytelling that I want to do? And then B, you know, doesn't 
touch deeply on plot points that I haven't fully decided on. Uh, B doesn't include a bunch of expensive high detail art that I can't do. <laughs> and D doesn't involve a, a voice actor that I don't have the budget to, to pay. Uh, and so it was like, it was like I, so I want to do this in a way that, that looks good and feels good and doesn't feel like a really cheap thrown together intro. And then I, you know, I kind of had this idea of just like, oh, what if I did like, I remember being kind of inspired by like the, um, I've, I'm trying desperately to get caught up on The Walking Dead, actually, mm -hmm. and I've I've always really liked the intro for that show, where it's just like you get um you get like these little like bits of well it's changed, but like the original intro for Walking Dead, you kind of get these like these bits and pieces that kind of show parts of the universe and kind of like hint at like things that are going on in the story or things that were important in the previous season. And, but there's no, like, there's nothing like in your face about it. You know, it's all, it's all fairly, you know, like fairly subtle and it's there and then it's gone and it doesn't linger. And I was like, well, let's do something like that. Like, let's just, let's have some, some imagery that let's, that kind of tells a story without like throwing it in your face. But then some of it's a little more over like the, you know, the article hinting at, you know, a detective being thrown off of a case and I remember showing this to a few of my a few of my friends and uh and I, I hadn't had I had like the first half of it done and I showed it to them I was like hey what do you guys think and one of my friends as a joke uh he was just like he's like oh is this your your is this going to be like a like a hardened grizzled detective he's uh, too you know like got too close to the job and it was just like you're gonna have like a, a whiskey glass in your next scene and I was literally in blender modeling my whiskey glass <laughs> and I was like Perfect. no I'm definitely not doing it's that. Not whiskey, it's bourbon. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it like I it's like I, I recognize the story's maybe maybe a little a little played out, but like like who else who else is going to go after the coal, right? It's got to be somebody. Exactly. Uh, it's like you know, there are certain stories that require certain protagonists. Like if you have a police procedural, you can't have a maverick cop who lives by his own rules because then it wouldn't be a procedural; it'd be a thriller. Right. Yeah. Right. It's just you know there's and, certain stories that require certain characters. Simple as that. Yeah, and and I'm I'm excited to, I'm excited to to kind of go into more of the protagonist's backstory and like why they why they're here and why they why they care. Um, but also you know like this isn't going to be a, a big in your face uh, character with a bunch of one liners mm -hmm. and and dialogue either. So um, it's going to be just one of those hands off storytelling things that. Uh, but I, I'm I'm kind of I don't even know how I'm going to do it yet. So I'm really excited to kind of to kind of sit down and think about it and and figure it out as the story goes along. I don't think I'd be averse to doing uh to doing like like some some little text logs and stuff that people can read if they want or skip if they want. Um, but it, you know I don't think it's going to be one of those things where you're looking for um like you know padlock codes and stuff in yeah. in the in in the in the written material because that's like one of the things about uh, one of the things about like like Doom Three and and the new Prey is like there's so often like I really appreciate what they what they're doing with like all the emails and the text logs and stuff like that but if I'm being honest I'm not going to read them all like I'm just not I and I, and I feel bad I feel bad for the guy at Bethesda who wrote all of the books in the Skyrim universe that I will never oh, yeah. read like like I feel bad for that guy because I'm sure I that, literally that, that when, person. On the, when, when I play as a, an Elder Scrolls game the times I do I usually just skip 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 skill point okay done exactly just, yep Yep. And so, and so it's just like, it's one of those things where I, I don't, I don't, I don't like feeling like I have to read the emails because there might be like a, 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 pe like a key code in there that I need. Mm -hmm. And I, and I get that like all those key codes are for secrets and like bonuses. And so it's an exploration reward, but it, it feels like it kind of cheapens the idea of a text log. If all you're doing is like flipping through them, looking for, for numbers, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, and so it's like, it's kind of a line where A, I'm not a good enough writer to come up with a ton of text logs, um, but B, like I, I, I don't want to write a whole bunch of them and like put and like put a lot of effort and soul into like writing these cool lore entries and then watch Twitch stream after Twitch stream people, people skipping just them skipping all. Through them, yeah. <laughs> I think it, it would hurt too much. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think the one time that doing that, looking for, you know, specific information in text logs like that has worked for me, really, really worked was with uh, Phantom Doctrine. You ever played that one? Uh, I have not. I'm going to Google it though. It's a, a tur turn-based XCOM-like in Cold War spy thriller kind of thing. Where you're operating a top secret, you know, well, blacker than black ops kind of espionage uh, organization. Oh man! And one of the things you do is gather up intel and have to tie these uh, pieces of intel together, match up keywords to you know to find code names and of operations and operatives in order to unlock missions where you can then you know attempt to stop that operation or kidnap that operative, put him through MK Ultra brainwashing and recruit him to your side. 
or just put a, look really cool yeah or then put a bomb in his brain sent him back and then just you know okay activate his key phrase he's now on our side he goes in kills his friends and then we blow his head off uh, that looks like really it's, cool i really like yeah. the art style of that game that's oh, yeah it's pretty cool they're actually making a sequel that's more like a hitman style game so that's interesting Ooh. well i think maybe it's a different developer team under the same one i I have to look into it, but yeah. But anyway, back to your game. Let's do concentrate there. That's, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of like the you know, storyline, you've already set up a very unique tone for the game, I think. Not just, you know, in terms of, well, especially in comparison to your influences here. If you look at the start of Blood, the very first thing that happens is Caleb rising from his grave going, I live again. Total Army of Darkness reference. And you here have your character emerging from a mass grave, hands bloodied, shaking and traumatized, wondering where the hell he is and, you know, what he's going to do next. So already you've got a significant tonal difference there. It's much more horrific, much more, you know, tense and, you know, creepy, I guess is the uh, proper word for it. And then to add to that, you have a particular graphical style that, well, if you'd like to talk more about that, you're, I'd say when I looked at it for the first time, the thing that came to mind actually of all the games was Manhunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the color scheme, that sense that you don't want to cut yourself anything because you might get tetanus. Just yeah. um, like the world looks grimy and dark and rusted and unpleasant in a good way. That's kind of funny. I get, I've had a lot of people uh, talk about the game being too brown, which is funny because the color palette's actually mostly blue. Uh, mm -hmm. or it used to be and so uh, i used to see you know people would post a screenshot or and they'd be like they'd be like man this like this game really just uh, is a brown fest and then 80 percent of the screenshot is blue and so it, it's just kind of like it's like eh, i don't think i don't think that's the right color you're talking about but um yeah the color palette was an interesting decision to begin with because i knew that palletizing the game was going to be a polarizing decision like there's mm -hmm. there's going like i feel like no matter how well you pull off an art style there's going to be people who who don't like it it's just like like yeah. i um i don't remember who i was talking to but it was like like the the, the obra din um it was mm -hmm. like that that black and white uh just like it's it's either white like white or black dithered art style yeah, yeah. like and, and that's one of those things that like it looks it looks great like it's a really cool aesthetic it's from the same guy but, papers please right is it i don't know i'm not actually i think it sure. was but it's like if you are but if you're not into that art style like if you're somebody who needs more detailed visuals or more detailed mm. color to immerse yourself in a game then like you know it's just not going to work for you and so like i really i knew that going in um but i also knew that like that's the vision i wanted for cultic like i wanted it yeah. to i wanted it to have that that kind of 90s build engine you know like 256 color look but not to be an actual hardware limitation but rather like as an artistic choice like a stylization mm -hmm. and so a lot of the elements of the world are designed so that they they work well in that palette you know so like a lot of the the rocks and the caves and the cliff faces are all shifted in hue towards like a blue instead of like gray and brown so that they contrast with like you know the ground and the grass and the ceilings and and then all of the explosions have to be have to be you know rendered and tinted a certain way before they get palletized so that they don't, they don't turn into like shades of yellow and green but they mm. stay like the reds and orange that i want um but i will say when you know like when the when the demo came out that was my biggest piece of feedback was there were people who absolutely loved the color palette and there were people who absolutely hated it and and i you know i anticipated that so i added an option to just turn the palette off entirely which kind of makes the game look like a like a, like a source port it's not bad but it's not what i had in mind for it either yeah. but i would rather somebody turn the palette off and play the game in a way that i didn't envision than for them to not play it at all and not enjoy it um, and so that option's there, but I also wanted to kind of compromise for the folks who liked the palette, but thought that it was a little too limiting. So I went back through and I like went to like 10 different spots in the demo, 10 different areas, like, like out in the trees, you know, inside the buildings, inside the caves. And I took some screenshots and I identified like, like, okay, what colors are missing from the palette? Like what areas is it really obvious that there's big splotches of like one color because there's a color that's not present. And yeah. the color palette only, only had 32 colors in it. It was extremely limited color palette. Um, so, so people are like, I, I don't know about this 256 color. I'm like, ah, it's actually a 32 color palette, it's very small. <laughs> um, and so I actually expanded it by only six colors. Um, the that's biggest, all it took? Yeah, well, like, 
there's I think there's some folks who still don't enjoy it, which which is fine. And you know, you just turn, maybe maybe just turn the palette off in your case. But like the, there were a lot of reds that were missing. Like there were only mm. like a couple of reds in the palette, and so a lot of things like blood were getting turned into browns, like into like browns and grays. Which it's a game that's going to have a lot of blood in it. So like obviously there needs to be red. So I added like three new shades of red, and then like a couple darker tones of green to help the like the nature and the grass pop out without turning into blue or brown. Um, and so it was really just like adding in some swatches where they were sorely lacking um and i think that's going to be the new standard i use going forward and i've been you know like tweaking lighting and tweaking things here and there i tweaked the shader for for pickups so that they ignore like a certain percentage of ambient light so that they're always standing out a little bit and i might wind up doing the same thing with enemies just so they have a little bit of pop against the background um but it's just been it's been a really interesting thing to kind of to see people respond to because like it's like it, it's a horror themed game it's at night and people run around without using a light source like they break every lantern in the game and they don't use a light source ever, ever. and then they're like i can't it's hard to see the enemies i'm like you're in the dark and you're not using your light like yes yeah, like they have bright have glowing red a, eyes you have a lighter use it yeah it's it's like it's a dark like i it it's a dark game it's a dark game that takes place in dark places you're inside a cave for like half of the demo like if you can't see enemies that well pull the lighter out there and there's a reason that there's a balance on it. it's not like a doom 3 thing where if you have a lighter yeah. out you can't use any weapons if you have a lighter out you can only use your one-handed weapons you know and uh i i, I animated a flip cock for the lever action just so you could use it <laughs> one-handed like it, it's, uh, uh and so it's, it's one of those things that's like, like yeah like i understand the criticism but also like consider this and you know it was like people um you know i got a lot of complaints that you know like when cultists are in the dark it's kind of hard to tell what kind of cultist it is um and it goes like well i can't tell the color of the robe it's like well then don't use the color of the robe as an indicator use, yeah, use, use the fact that shooting at you well, it's like you, it's like you can use their silhouette. Every cultist is posed differently. Like you know, the axe cultist holds an axe up above his head. The pistol cultist holds his pistol up at his hip. The sten cultist has a belt and is held at his you know side. And then you know, and like every enemy makes different sound effects. You know, like the axe cultists have a different set of voice lines. The sten cultist, you can hear his his magazine pouch rattling around when he walks. Um, the axe cultist oh, really? is the only enemy that can that. run. Yeah, and so it's like there's all there's all these there's all these other clues that can tell you like what kind of enemies are lurking in the in the shadows, and like every enemy has a distinct sound for when they raise their weapon and when they're about to shoot, and so like there are, and so like yes, I understand that you can't see the color of the robe this guy is wearing, but he's standing in the dark, so like that's not a cue that you're going to be able to work off of, um, and so it's just one of those things that's like like I understand the complaint, but it's not you're coming at this problem like you're playing you know duke nukem you're not playing duke nukem you're playing cultic like cultic is a dark game and like and you ha and you have to use the tools to your advantage for that and if you break every single lighter in the environment because lighting cultists on fire is fun then like it's going to be dark and so you're going to need to use your lighter um, <laughs> or you make your own light with the newly improved molotov cocktails yeah and that's gonna that's something i'm really excited to get to get finished up but um i, I got a whole a whole other system to put in place for that but, but yeah so like the, the art style is really fun i love working with it i love like 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 getting and then throwing it into a sprite and and seeing it in the cultic palette for the first time and it instantly mm -hmm. goes from being like this unrelated 3d model generic whatever to being like a cultic graphic like and, and so i really enjoy cultic having its own like unique style i think that's my favorite thing about the art style it's just that it, it's it's unique and so you know i have uh, the art style has gotten a lot of hate more than i was expecting you know a lot of folks that really really just don't like it but um that you know that's but it's the uniquely your art style and that in and of itself is going to help differentiate your game from all the other different like the we're in a glut of retro style shooters right now and anything that can help you stand apart from everybody else is definitely going to be a godsend yeah and, and and like yeah and so like, i understand like if you don't like the art style you don't like it and that's why the option to turn the palette off is there but i i love the art style of cultic i put a lot of work into it yeah, so me it's, too. Not going, it's it's not going to go away and it's not going to be defaulted to turned off like that's not going to happen um nice. but the option the option to turn the palette off will always be there for folks who don't enjoy it and that's fine like it sucks it sucks that people don't like it it really it really hurts it hurt, hurts my little feelers but um but it's but it's fine it's it's there's a lot of people out there and i want everyone to be able to enjoy the game so you know as many as many accessibility things and as many you know things that i can add in there that help people enjoy the game without compromising my vision for what i want cultic to be is that's fine it's not not too difficult to do speaking of your vision you put a lot of voxel work into this game yeah yeah, there's a lot of voxels in there. Um, <laughs> I gotta say that was that was impressive, like seeing all the voxel corpses everywhere, voxel objects, voxel 
voxels, voxel, vox. I just, you know, how hard is it to create that using the Unity engine? Because previous, like the build engine and stuff like that, it's designed to work with those kind of things. But the Unity engine is a 3D model engine. So for, for those who don't know, voxels are to 3D what a pixel is to 2D. It's, you know, a different way of rendering specific objects using that kind of style. So how did you go about creating those kinds of things in Unity? So th there's really no like voxel magic or anything. All the voxel objects are just 3D models. Um, so there's nothing nothing fancy going on there. Um, but I actually use um, I actually use a program called Cubicle mm -hmm. uh, to make my voxel. I was originally going to do everything in 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 Magic of Voxel because that was the only voxel program I'd ever used, and it was free and it was super nice. Um, but the problem is that like you know all of the models and stuff in Cultic have fairly realistic textures. Yeah, I mean yes, they're palletized, but they're mostly photo sourced from like real photos and then mm -hmm. stylized. And so um, doing voxel stuff in Magic of Voxel, I was going to have to do everything like pixel by pixel or voxel by voxel. Yeah. And well, I, I don't think I'm a terrible pixel artist. I'm not that good. Um, and so, and then I, so I did a little research and found out that Cubicle, which is a paid program, has the ability to voxelize a 3D model, including taking texture data and turning it and, and using that to color the voxels. And so like a lot of the work is done for me. I mean, like there's, there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen, of course. you know, cause a lot of, because a lot of times just the texture doesn't look quite right or there's holes in the model that, you know, just come from the voxelization. But like Cubicle has the ability to plug in color tables too. So I just, I like was able to input the Cultic palette. Um, and so like that way, you know, I got all the colors. I, and so that was, that was incredible. And I was like, okay, well, this is going to make it doable. Because like I was considering scrapping voxels because of how difficult it was to put a voxel model together. And I'm that like, I- horrible. Like if I, if I had if I had my own artist to do the voxel models that would be different, but it, it's me. I have to do them. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so and so finding Cubicle was was incredible. It's been so fun to work with. Um, so if, if anybody is looking for a good voxel program, I would give it a try. I think they have a demo. I don't know if the demo comes with the voxelizer. I bought it and it was 100% worth it. So the way that yeah, they, I'm reminded of the way they did you know old school sprite enemies, for instance, in you know those previous games where they basically made a clay model. Turned it around, took pictures of everything, and then you know rendered those into sprites, and then animated it from there. So it's you know taking actual real life objects and using those as your basis is pretty much you know part of the course break. It's this kind of thing, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, the, so I the thing with the voxels is like I wanted to have. I don't think there's a way I can say this without trash talking cars in the build engine. Oof. vehicles in the build engine look rough and like yeah gra and granted the, the fact the fact that like shadow warrior was able to have like like moving vehicles in the build engine is is some level of of you know of build engine magic that i have no i i could never replicate myself and it's so, like there's a lot of respect there for making it work but it's one thing that doesn't hold up well to yeah, modern yeah. you know to modern aesthetics but i wanted to have like the trucks and the semis and the excavators and i wanted to have you know set pieces in the world that aren't um, that aren't just sprites and that aren't super blocky, you know, you know, like, like 3d models that were obviously built in like a map editor, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's, and it's like, you know, as, as cool as a lot of the decorations are in, in, in like doom, for example, like those, those big gnarly tree sprites you get in the outdoor levels of doom, like they, they look great as sprites, but they're just like, they, they just, I, they don't sell the atmosphere because, you know, they're When you they're move flat. around them, they're always fight facing you. Yeah. And so it's one of those things that like these larger objects, I wanted them to look, I wanted them to have detail. I wanted to be able to create impressive looking 3D objects, but not have them be, you know, like regular, you know, meshed models. Because the idea is that this game is supposed to emulate a game that came out when, when skinned meshes weren't a thing. And so the rule that I have for, for making the rule that I usually stick to when I'm working on Cultic is if it's a skinned mesh, like if it's a mesh that would require a rig and skinning, it's a, it's a sprite. So all the enemies are sprites, right? Yeah. If it's, um, if it's, you know, like something that you could feasibly model in like the hammer editor, for example. So like, like the tents and the trees and yeah. the caves, if it's something that, and, and, and like the rocks and stuff like that, if it's something that you could feasibly model in a map editor, it gets to be a 3d model. Um, and so, you know, all, all the, the boulders and the trees and the, and the light poles and stuff, those are all just 3d models because yeah, simple could, poly you, polygonal, uh, uh, structures, so to speak. Right. But then if there's a model that would just be an absolute colossal pain in the ass to make in a map editor or impossible to do properly, like, 
like the trucks and stuff like that, it gets a voxel model. So that's kind of the rule I'm trying to stick to. Um, but the problem is like detailed voxel models have an absolute crap load of vertices in them. Um, like, the, like the excavator model, the low poly 3D model that it's originally is, is like, I want to say it's like maybe 9,000 triangles. It's not that many. And then the voxel model has like 75,000. Like it is a Ooh. massive jump, which still isn't a ton by like AAA standards, but it's it's a lot when you're trying to like make a game perform well in Unity. Yeah. Um, and so, and so it's one of those things that like it's it's also like I want this I want this voxel excavator to look great, but I also don't want it to tank the frame rate when it comes on screen. Um, and so there's like a, um, and so that's why like a lot of those voxel models actually have like a custom shader that I cobbled together that does like, um, it's, it's just a really basic average light shader that ignores like shadowing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it like basically assumes that the model is being hit at this, like the same time with an average amount of light. Um, and so that's why like you don't get super detailed light, you know, like lighting or shadows on those objects because all of the shadows of every single voxel looks really weird. Um, and you can actually see it on the destructible barrels, I think, because I think I forgot to apply that shader to those objects. I just noticed the other day. Um, well, but it's, it's like Nobody's it's like perfect. voxel models look terrible when they're shade like when when they self shadow, they look terrible. And so like you have to make sure they don't self shadow and and whatnot. I so. think people underestimate the amount of work that goes into a creating something that looks good, but also getting it to run properly. You know, given the engine limitations and all these things, so especially when it comes right. to like you know. Well, you know, why didn't they do this? Because if you did, you wouldn't be able to play the game anymore because it would suck. Yeah, and like, and that's another thing I struggle with was the game's performance because I have, I have a pretty beastly, a pretty beastly computer rig, um, and that. so, and, and so, like, I can run Coltic in the Unity editor, which has a ton of overhead, while I have like OBS recording and high quality, and I have like you know a bunch of other stuff going, and I don't have any problems. But as soon as I send it off to start playtesting is when I had a couple people that were like, yeah, this doesn't run well for me at all. And I was like, well, that is not good. Um, and so I, you know, I've been trying to do some deep dives on performance and I, and I've made some huge improvements to like the CPU optimizations on scripts and like learning about how to try and do occlusion culling. So stuff that doesn't need to be drawn, isn't drawn. And I'm, I'm working on trying to do some, some big like mesh batching so that like all of the grass and trees and stuff can be batched together instead of all drawing separately. Um, but at a certain point I have to start pushing back on, on performance complaints because I get I get folks who will say like you know well the game doesn't run well for me and I'm like oh that sucks like could you provide me with the specs of your rig so I can and see it's what a we're scientific on. calculator well well it's it's like yeah you know it's like a laptop with an with an integrated graphics chip and I'm like well it's it's not it's probably not going to run great for you and you know and there's a lot of pushback on that because like well it looks like a build engine game so it's run like a building well it's that's not though like yes the enemies are 2d sprites but this game also has like thirty thousand objects in game that are shadowed like there's there's sixty five thousand objects in the first map alone like you know and a lot of those have physics and the enemies are all trying to pathfind around and and you've got you know all these real like all these dynamic lights running because you know every single Pretty, pretty much every single light source can be destroyed. Like, you know, you can blow all these lights up and all these lanterns can be thrown. So you've got a ton of dynamic lights. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying there's not room for optimization because there definitely is. And it's, it's, you know, it's a lesson I'm having to learn and work on. But at the same time, like this isn't Doom 2. It's not running in, you know, in, in a custom engine designed by geniuses. So it's, you know, running in Unity and being developed by me. So it's, uh, yeah, there's, yeah. Go there's, going, <laughs> there's going to be some performance overhead on it. Um, and it's just like one of those things that, I, I want it to run really well for everybody, but I, you know, I also don't want to compromise yeah. what makes the game work. You know, like, yeah, like it's having not the, just the visuals; it's also all the invisible stuff that's running behind, like you said, the pathfinding, all the physics elements, all the different calculations running in the background to try and get, uh, you know, certain interactions going on. All the different interactables, for instance, like you said, for the you know picking stuff up, and because even just you know, you kill a cultist with the axe, take his head off, pick up the head, throw it at another cultist. All that stuff is running in the background, regardless of whatever you know, amount of polygons are currently on screen. So that's definitely going right. to have an impact. Right. And so, and it's, it's just a lot of to like trying to figure out where the limitation is. Um, and so like initially I assumed when people were having problems, it was a GPU thing. I was like, oh, it's probably just like too much stuff rendering on screen. Um, and so I went and did a whole bunch of optimizations, optimizations for that. And for one of my friends who does have a very, a very crappy GPU, it did help them. Um, but for other folks who had good 
graphics cards, it didn't make much of a difference. And so then I started looking into profiling um, the scripts that were running and realized I just had some like massive CPU hogs that were just <laughs> taking a ridiculous amount of time to run. And so I, you know, you go through and it's like, you know, you've got to, to make a game run at 60 frames per second, you've got like 16 milliseconds or something like that for each frame to run. And it's like, 20% of that budget is being taken up by one script. And that that's Oof. not good. Like that that's clearly a problem. Yeah. And that's so, not, you know, that is and not so, optimal. And so it's it's a lot of these scripts that you write when you're in the development stage, like the early development. You're like, well, I, I just need this enemy to be able to follow me around. I don't really care how optimal it is right now because I just need it to work so I can keep building the game. And then you go back and you're like, okay, that garbage script I wrote six months ago runs like garbage also and, and it needs to be cleaned up and so that was a big part of this like enemy overhaul too was um, putting a lot of optimizations in place for like how often they try to call for pathfinding how often do they try to figure out what the slope of the ground below them is how often do they try to check for another player you know and just like trying to figure out how often that needs to happen so they're not doing all of these really expensive calculations on every single frame um and so just stuff like that it's all, all a big learning experience and it's just it just sucks because like my 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 computer bless her heart runs the game great and so you know it was like the first time somebody was like yeah i'm getting like 30 frames per second i was like oh shit that sucks <laughs> it's like okay time to buy myself a potato <laughs> i got to get yeah. myself a really crappy toaster computer just to be able to test this stuff yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it's, yeah. And also, that's probably what I should do. I should probably go dig my old college laptop out of storage and start using that as my benchmark. But even, even that thing from 2010 has better specs than some of the reports <laughs> I've gotten. And so it's oh, just God. like, you know, and so, but that's one of those things, as I imagine, that's just part of the game development cycle is, you know, yeah. like every, every company that releases a game has to decide at some point what their minimum specs are. Mm -hmm. And so, and so while I do have a lot of work I still want to do on optimization, at some point, I'm going to have to decide like, like where where is where where am I going to stop? Where am I going to say like okay like this is the level of hardware you have to have to run the game, and and I and I want it to run well for everybody. Um, yeah. But I I I'm Speaking not. Speaking as I'm, someone who worked in QA for a couple of years, I can tell you at some point there's nothing you can do. You know, yeah. Like we had like a dozen different PCs for when we were doing it. Like I worked for a QA for Activision for a while, and we did do the uh, King's cool. Quest the King's Quest remakes. Mm. Yeah. Nice. And, and we had multiple computers running them all. And, you know, some of them, you know, it's just like the textures just went low and everything was this white and blue checkerboard look for everything. It was just like, okay, what, what, am I clicking on the right spot? I can't tell. Everything looks the same. It's just yeah. nothing was rendering properly. And then, and then we start getting it work right, but then something else would glitch. And it's just like for everything you fix, there's 10 other things that break for a while. And then, or then you have like, I've recently had to do some troubleshooting on my editing software. Because it turns out that my editing software was working terribly. So I uninstalled and reinstalled everything. Then then I just installed on a different hard drive and everything runs smooth as butter now. It's just some things you just can't prepare for. Yeah, I got to figure out what's uh, like my uh, my digital audio workstation for working on music. My, uh, my plugin that loads all my instruments just like stopped working. And I've used it for... I've probably used it for a decade, never had a problem with it. And now suddenly it's not working. And I'm just like, oh, oh good. I need, I need to figure that out. And I've never had to troubleshoot it before. So that's going to be, that's going to be fun. That's gonna be so fun. If, any, if anybody out there knows why the, uh, the play plugin for, for Fruity Loops just uh, stops working on its own, let me know. So shoot comment me, just, drop me a comment line. down below. That's right. Drop me a line. Let me know what the heck's going on. It's all probably right. just going to be a reinstall. Cause like all of it's running off of a hard drive that I got like 10 years ago. So I should yeah, probably just go, yeah. get a new hard drive for it at this mm. point. At a certain point, that's pretty much all you can do. <laughs> Reinstall. Uh, yeah. So you do your own music for all these games too, don't you? Yeah, all of them. I do all the music and and audio mixing. So pretty much everything. If it's in the game, I I, I did it. <laughs> Except the font, which I'm going to make my own. <laughs> I love the I, I love I love the Allegard font, but I've seen like three other games pop up, even like during Realms Deep, that all use the same font, and I was like, uh oh, I'm gonna have to go find a new font. Whoops. So that's that's on my that's on my backlog. I want to make my own font. So mm. which I think I can do. I have a background as a graphic designer. I should be able to do that, right? Oh, there should you be, go. Should be no problem. I mean, you're good enough to make your own game. You should be able to make your own font. <laughs> Absolutely. If I can do pathfinding, I can do kerning. It's same deal. Same <laughs> same category. Uh, so speaking of more uh, great uh, acts of creation, one of the things I love particularly in uh, first person games is good melee systems. And I don't know how you managed to pull it off, but that hatchet feels damn good. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's one of my favorite things too. I am a big, I'm a big like any game that I play that has 
a good melee system. Mm -hmm. I'm the melee guy. Like I'm, I'm really into hunt right now. Uh, yeah. My friends and I have been playing the crap out of that. And I, I'm the guy who always has a hatchet or a saber. Like I just, whenever we play Left for Dead, I'm the only guy with like you know hundreds of melee kills because I, I love the like, just like the it, it's uh it's. For, well, first of all, satisfying. Like, if you have a really satisfying melee system, melee feels good to use. Yeah. Um, but it's also just like, it's like the same feeling as a game where your starter weapon has infinite ammo. Like, you have that old reliable, you know, like that that old reliable weapon that just, it feels good to use. You feel like, you feel powerful and safe while you're using it because you know that you're not... I, I, I'm a hoarder in games, like Skyrim, yeah, potion yeah. hoarding, whatever. Oh, God, yeah. I, I, and so having something that doesn't use ammo, so I'm not worried about how frivolously I use it, is 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 also great. Uh, but it's just I like I'm a uh, love I love melee. So and and probably one of the only things I don't like about blood is the pitchfork. Like I just don't think it's satisfying to use. Um, and, it's and good, it, it's but good it, against but, the rats and the little hands and maybe the zombies. But beyond that, yeah. You know. Well, it, it just feels like one of those weapons that's designed to be to be outmoded, which is uh, which is what I consider a problem in games. When like when you you have a gun and then you get another gun that makes it so you never use the first gun ever again. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want I didn't want melee to be like that. Um, and so I wanted the hatchets, and, and it was entirely a crapshoot. I didn't know if people were going to like the hatchet at all. And then I watch uh, runs where people use the hatchet more than I do. Uh, and it's, and it's like, people get like, I added the hatchet throwing like pretty close to re release and I don't use hatchet throwing very often, uh, myself because I prefer to like slide in and get it and just chop their head right off <laughs> in cultic, in cultic. This is all cultic related for any, <laughs> it's any, all any, cultic uh, related. That's right. Any, but then I watched uh, decapitated bodies found near this man's home are completely unrelated. But I've watched so many, so many streams of people who are just like, like the first thing they do is try to get good at throwing the axe. And that's like, yeah. sick. And then somebody, somebody was reviewing it and they were like, yeah, if you get a headshot with a thrown hatchet, it, it one shot any cultist, even on the hardest difficulty. I'm like, it's not supposed to, but I don't <laughs> think I can change it now. <laughs> it's not supposed to do that much damage, but I mean, part of, part of the damage is multiplied by its velocity. Mm -hmm. um, so harder throws do more damage, and I'm I'm just gonna guess that my math is bad because it's not <laughs> supposed to do. It's the same reason why throwing an eyeball at a cultist used to just blow them up because it, oh, you know, it just it just the ma the the physics the or like the, the fact that you added separate eyeballs for when somebody's head explodes is just mwah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> I think my favorite part about it is that like. The eyeballs don't seem to, it's it's probably a bug, honestly. But like when you when you shoot somebody's head, it creates a bunch of uh, a bunch of gibbs all at once. And then it's supposed to fling them all in different directions. But for some reason, the eyeballs don't respond to that. And so it's, it's like a cartoon where like their head blows up and their eyeballs just like fall to the <laughs> ground. And they're always together. And they always look so shocked at what just happened. <laughs> And it's, it's my favorite thing ever when somebody like somebody's playing it and they and they blow a cultist's head off and the cultist's eyes are just sitting there on the ground like did that oh okay and so it's like one of those things that like it's technically a bug but I don't think I can take it out like I think it's just gonna have to stay there. Some of the, some of the best uh, features in a lot of games are bu are bugs like the uh, speaking of melee Dark Messiah Might and Magic the way the uh, which is you know one of the best melee uh, first person melee right. games out there the ice spell. That you use to, you can either freeze an enemy or you can freeze the ground and have enemies just slip and slide and fall on their ass when they walk into mm -hmm. it. That was a bug. The ice effect there was not supposed to be that effective, but you know, one day the developers that. come and saw the QA guys just you know <laughs> playing around this and laughing their heads off, and they're saying, "What are you doing? Oh, we found this cool thing. You put the ice on the ground, and they just run up through it and just fall flat on their face, and we just kill them." And it's like, okay, that's staying in the game. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's, that's. I think some of my favorite bugs are like just the ones that are completely unexpected. Like I, um, when I first added the shotgun cultist's ability to throw dynamite, um, every every object in the game that can deal damage has a an owner property to it. So like the the object knows who created it, so that you can attribute that damage because there's an infighting system. So like, mm -hmm. you know, if the player throws dynamite, it needs to know that the player's the one that threw the dynamite. Um, but there wasn't a there wasn't originally anything in the code that pr would prevent enemies from targeting themselves but you know uh -oh. none of the enemies would be able to damage themselves because they're shooting bullets but the, the the dynamite cultist i figured out pretty quick if he got hit with the splash damage of his own dynamite he would sometimes target himself and i thought it was a pathfinding bug at first because sometimes shotgun cultists would just start like running in circles like they would just <laughs> do circles 
And I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on because I thought it was a pathfinding. So I like, I wrote out this big debugger to like show their pathfinding and show what they were doing. And like, no, their pathfinding every time was working properly. Like it wasn't like a pathfinding problem. Um, but what it was is, you know, they were getting hit by the splash damage from this TNT. And then it was like, okay, I've been dealt damage. Who dealt me the damage? Me. Okay. Fuck that guy. And then they're, and then they just start trying to shoot themselves, which they can't do, but they can throw dynamite at themselves. <laughs> but the, because I'm not very good at math, the code for throwing for throwables at all is based on how, how high of an angle do I have to throw this to make it hit the player? And so that means that if they're trying to throw it at themselves, they throw it straight up really hard. And so another side effect of this bug was they would just start throwing dynamite into the atmosphere. Like they would just throw it straight up in the air. And it's just like, I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. Like for some reason, my shotgun cultists were just, you know, being idiots. And, uh, and then they finally, bugged out they, through the power of self-loathing. <laughs> Yeah. And so finally, it was just like I looked through, I was looking through all of their properties in the inspector, and I realized that the target was set to themselves. I was like, ah, that makes sense, which I should know because I've had this happen to me before. And in Unholy Commotion, the project I worked on before this, which also had a Mauser C96, um, the, that game was a little more comical. And that's actually, a, that's actually a fun game of mine if you want to go play that. Um, well, it's, it's, it's okay. But when you, when you reload the Mauser in that one, um your guy like he like flicks the stripper clip off of the top when he's done oh. and the stripper clip turns into a one damage projectile um oh, no. and so and and so it was i actually noticed this the first time during i when i was adding a boss in the game just like giant skeleton and armor and uh and he's like this huge like 10 foot tall monstrosity and i was play testing one time and i was like i was dodging an attack and i was reloading at the same time and i flicked the clip off and it does one damage to him and then suddenly his head just like looks straight down at the ground and oh, no. he just and he just starts attacking the stripper clip <laughs> laying on the ground oh no <laughs> Because the stripper clip, as an entity that could deal damage, was treated as an infighting an entity. Infighting entity. Oh god! <laughs> so I, so I had to add like, so there's like now, so I had like a team ID, and it's on team negative one, and anything that's on team negative one doesn't get pat, doesn't they can't be infighted with. But it was just like one of those things that he, this guy's. I have there's a video of it like way back on my Twitter <laughs> where he's these guys just like wailing on the stripper clip on the ground, oh, and it's my great. God. Oh. Game dev is would have to be invented if game dev did not invent for moments like this. Game dev would have to be invented because that is just too good a story not to exist. Yeah, I, I like. I, I really hope that someday I have a bug that's on par with like giants and Skyrim, like just one of those things that just goes down in the history books. Um, uh, and then you're and then you're just like, yeah, that was intended for sure. I definitely meant to do that. I think my favorite bug of all time. This is back also in my QA days. We did the, the console ports of Chivalry. And okay. whenever someone got shot with the giant ballistas, their character models would freak out on impact, literally start twisting in on themselves and start climbing up walls and stuff. Just as insanity. you do, yeah. it's total insanity. Oh, god, yeah, that's so, yeah. right. Uh, so yeah, that is we were talking about melee combat, I think. Yeah, I think that's where we were, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, melee yeah. combat. The, so the hatchet actually went through uh, a big revision. It was originally a very, a, a pretty typical. You just like could, would just mash left click and you would just do mm -hmm. one one attack with it. Yeah. Whereas and now I, you have a kind of combo system where it's left and then right with the yeah, and, and you can charge it. Charge yeah. It yeah. And like I think it the was only time I've ever seen something like that was a PS2 game called Shadow of Rome, where you could actually do that same kind of charge up attack at any point during a combo. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't played that one, but um, it was more of just a thing where, like, I realized eventually that I never used the hatchet. Like, I just, it, as, I would just, as soon as I got another weapon, I would switch to it. Yeah. Um, and it was like, I want ammo management to be a part of the game. Like, not, not like survival horror levels, but like, you should be on, on extreme, especially, you should be thinking about how you're using your ammo, like using the environment to your advantage. And if the player didn't have a good melee weapon that felt good to use and that could be used in a relatively low risk kind of way then you know like like if, if you couldn't run up to an enemy without trading damage that's i didn't want trading damage to ever yeah, be yeah. a thing and so like you know the the wind up is enough damage to one shot most cultists if you hit them in the head like to just chop their heads right off yeah. and you can and hold on to it until you get to the enemy that's right yeah and you can and you can hold on to your axe your throw too like when you're charging a throw up mm -hmm. and uh and it's really cool to see people playing with the axe the first time that they ever, like almost everybody I watch play the game doesn't try charging it at first. 
and then they find the charge by accident and then they are super surprised the first time they take an enemy's head off with it and then and then after that it's like the axe is now a viable weapon it's now something that i'm going to use weirdly i've i haven't seen a stream where anybody flushes a head down a toilet and i i had done that reason. <laughs> i added it again to the game for a reason no one does it it's so disappointing yeah, I found myself when I was using the when I didn't have any other weapons at the start of the game, just you know, getting used to the axe, I would like dodge out of the way of one of the hatchet uh, cultist throws, then get in close, do give him like a quick chop, then kick and just stun them, and then just finish them off the you know full on uh, attack. Yeah, yeah, the kick is really fun to use in in combo with uh, with the melee attacks because the mm -hmm. kick is almost guaranteed to stun lock an enemy out of attacking, um, and so like. With the exception of like the shotgun cultist, who's a little bit more resistant to being stunned out of his attack, um, usually you can just kick them in the face and they'll forget what they were doing and then you can just wail on them. Yeah. Um, but it comes with the risk of getting in close and flubbing the kick and getting murdered. So Yeah, but um, when you manage to pull it off while well, you got that double barrel in your hands, just unload both barrels in their face. Oh, that is fast mine. Yeah. And like one thing I don't see, I don't see a lot of people trying is like the kick is directional. And so like if you crouch down and kick up, you can knock them into the air and then shoot them out of the air. Um, whereas if you kick them like towards the ground, they're just, you know, they're already on the ground. So they'll just friction will slow them down. Um, so that's, if you haven't tried that yet, try kicking enemies into the air. That's, that's the fun way to do it. That's like my favorite thing to do with axe cultists is to slide in and then keep holding the crouch key. So you stay crouched and then kick them away from you and then shoot them with the lever action out of the air. That's like Cultist one of my favorite things shoot. to do. That's right. Which used to be super Oh, there should definitely be an achievement for that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there, there may or may not be a way in the future for the players' melee attacks to be a lot more powerful and kicking uh, will Ooh. be a lot more fun. So nice. uh, that'll, be, that'll be something that will probably have to be worked into an achievement at some point. Yeah. Like, like shooting an enemy when they're 30 meters off the ground or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. So speaking of shooting, one thing that I have seen a lot of people comment on beyond, you know, things like art style and stuff like that is how good the shooting feels in this game. Like I, the words I've seen used are crunchy, chunky, weighty all the you know there's some oomph to the uh, guns in this game so would you say that it's more a question of you know things like sound effects or you know the actual effect that the, just the damage that they do the effect uh, the uh, feedback from the enemies how do you get a weapon in a first person shooter to have that particular feel to it well it's it's you know it's a lot of those things together i think sound design is is just a huge part of it like a a crappy sound effect can absolutely ruin the feel of a gun. Like no matter, no matter how hard the screen shakes or how big the muzzle flashes or how far enemies go flying, if if the guns sound like pea shooters, they're going to feel like it too. And it's kind of it's kind of like conversely too. You know, like if you have even if your gun sounds great, if the feedback you get from firing it isn't isn't you know doesn't match that, then you know, it's just, it's just going to be a letdown. And so, yeah. you know, a big part of it is the sound effects. Like I really pride myself on my audio work. Um, and so a lot of it's just like making sounds that like there's, there's got to be like the punchiness, like that has to feel like, like you want to feel the kick of the weapon. Like you want to, so there's right. like, there's, there's always a lot of like bass that goes into the very initial pop of the round. Yeah. And then and I it compensates and then I, for the fact that you can't actually physically feel it. So you have your other right. sensors compensate for that. Right. And then I always try to get like, I always want to get like some like metallic sounds into the gun as well. And, you know, there's, I've just got like a huge folder of just like a lot of different gun rattling sounds and stuff that I try to mix in there. Um, and then, and then a lot of it's just the, like the animations too, like, you know, and a lot of it's exaggerated, but like, like you want to feel like that your player has just fired a really powerful gun, you know, like the, you know, there's like, uh, I think like, like killing floor one i think has my favorite handgun of all time like the nine millimeter in in killing floor one if, with the exception of like higher difficulties where it starts to kind of taper off like the sound effect is perfect my, it's like my favorite gun sound effect of all time killing floor one handgun just like it's perfect mm -hmm. um and then but just like like the snappiness of the animation the crispiness of the sound um like the particle effects that go into it how much it kicks back like everything everything about it is perfect it makes it feel so good to use and then killing floor two conversely like the the, the default nine mil in that game when the game came out really underwhelming it had like a um, just a really a really soft un, like unsatisfying sound effect it didn't really do that much damage to enemies it just didn't feel the same and then so it really ruined and that, they've improved it since then thank goodness yeah. but um this is one of those things that like you want you want the guns to always feel good to use and yeah. so um it's really just a combination of all of those things um it's 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 kind of hard to put kind of hard to put into yeah. words i found it um, kind of ironic that I've seen games where they take actual, you know, real gun sound effects 
And oftentimes, unless you actually like tweak them from reality to something higher than that, like heightened, uh, heightened the sound effect, it just doesn't sound right. Like, yep. I guess it's because, you know, when you're actually firing a real gun, like I've done, you know, back when you know, I was in the army and stuff like that, you have that tactical feel to it. You're in the moment, you're aiming down, aiming at your target. You've got the smell of the, you know, gunpowder in your, in your nose, the hear, sound in your ears, and then you feel the whole thing through you. Whereas in a video game, you're missing like several of your senses just right there. So like you said, you know, the sound is compensating for that. So you right. really have to like amp up the actual sound effect because otherwise it's just going to feel underwhelming, even if it is completely realistic. Yeah, it's kind of the bummer because like, I'm I, uh, like anytime you go on the web and you look for um, and you look for like fully gunshot sounds, they it's always really disappointing when you first look at it because like fully or like real real recorded gunshots are they're just pops like they're very mm -hmm. they're very I mean, which makes sense because like you can't like if you record it up close it's going to blow your microphone out yeah. and uh and if you record it at a distance you know all you're going to get is the report and so like you you know like it's it's a difficult thing and so i don't i don't think a lot of folks realize like how engineered fire like gunshot sounds are. Yeah, like oftentimes the, pistol like, sounds in movies are actually shotgun sounds yeah yeah, and also like like the the C96 in Coltic is um, the gunshot sound is like, oh boy, it's uh, it's like the bass sound is a sound effect of of a Makarov firing. I think I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I put the sound together. And then it's got like um, it's got like a a hint of a like uh, I think like a like a Mosin bolt being pulled back in there to like give it some of the like metallic feel, and then the report is just from some completely different sound effect that had a really nice like echo on it. And so like none of it is an actual Mauser C ninety six firing, um, and you know so a lot of it's a lot of these sound effects are just like are just you know they're just they're engineered and and that's you know and that's kind of the way it's got to be. Yeah, uh, that's it's just, for it's you. Good. It's like you know somebody had to make up a T Rex sound for Jurassic Park. They didn't go right. back in time to record that. They had to make stuff up on their own. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's and like audio design is honestly like really fascinating, like just how certain sounds are made. And it's some it's something like if I if I had like if I didn't live in the middle of nowhere Kansas, um, it would you know that would be one of my jobs I would really love to be as like an audio designer, audio engineer, and like get to record fully stuff like that. Cause it's, it's on, it's really fun. There's a lot of creativity that goes into it. Mm -hmm. um, but gun sounds are just like guns and explosions. It's just one of those things that like, they're, they're so heavily manufactured because you can't just like record an explosion or a gun, you know, because it's going to destroy your microphone. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, because of, you know, Hollywood and, and the games industry, like we're, we're kind of conditioned, like you said, of like how a gunshot sounds like yeah. all like pistols sound like, you know, it's either the stock desert Eagle sound effect that, you know, is used everywhere or, which I love that sound. I'm not dogging on it. Um, you know, or, or it's like the, you know, like you said, these shotgun sounds being used for, but it's also really funny how, like how a, a misused sound effect can like really pull you out of things. And it's like yeah, one of my yeah. favorite, one of my favorite examples of this that I always tell is, um, is actually from, again, The Walking Dead. Um, and I'm, for anybody who hasn't watched it, I'm going to try to stray away from spoilers here, but there's a, there's a scene in, uh, in one of the finales of a season where a particular character has been, has been bit. And, and so they, they have to, they have to kill them. They have to, you know, they're, it's, it's a really sad moment. It's a character that's been with the show for a while and it's this really, really sad drawn out scene. And then it's, you know, they decide that like, it's, you know, it's, it's Rick who's going to, who's going to shoot them. And he has his, his Python, his revolver. And, oh, I know and, exactly what you're talking about. And they, and, and it's like the, like the scene comes to a close and the camera draws at, back out of the room so you don't see it happen. And then like it just like cuts to black and you hear the gunshot sound and then a casing, casing clinking drops. on the floor. And you're it's like, a wait a second. Wait a second. And, and you're like, as most people, I mean, shouldn't and I say wouldn't and honestly shouldn't notice stuff like that because then you do stuff like this and complain about things that don't matter. But it's just one of those things that like when a sound is, is misused, you're like, wait a second. And, and yeah. on the other but flip, even on the that, flip, I think even people who aren't gun aficionados kind of recognize something's off there. Something is just, wait a minute. Yeah. And all like of a sudden, anybody, like, through the blur of tears from all oh, my favorite characters, what the hell did they just do? Yeah, or it's like with like how expensive ammo prices are right now. Watching like Supernatural and counting how many wasted rounds there are from like oh, people cock it, cocking a shotgun six hundred <laughs> times, or, or or pulling a slide back for dramatic effect, and it's just like up oh, there's there's another one gone. 
that's another bolt with your fingerprints on it that's been left completely unmangled and you know uh, for the cops to find congratulations boys <laughs> but i uh, uh man i i but I, i'm a, i'm a big gun guy too i'm not like a i'm not like a gun professional i'm not i'm not uh, i don't know everything there is to know but i am I, I'm a big gun aesthetics kind of guy. It's like yeah. whenever I go to a whenever I go to a gun show, like if it has wood furniture on it, I'm probably going to look at it and consider buying it. Yeah. Hence so the like Mauser. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's like hence well, hence, hence the Mauser. You know, it's just uh, one of those things. That's a, that's a fake one, by the way, because I don't I can't afford a real one. But um, that's like uh, like my entire gun collection right now is almost entirely novelty 22s. Just like 22s <laughs> that because because they're they're cheap to shoot and they're fun to shoot. But like there's like I've, I pick I have a mare's leg in 22 because I was like nice. I'm working on Coltic like I have to have a mare's leg. Um, and so and so it's just like uh, I'm a big gun aesthetics guy. So that's why you know they've got like the Sten Mark V and the Mauser C96 and the China Lake like all these guns that are just like. They're not. They're not like like the tactical guns that most you know modern shooters are rife with. They're you know they're all these guns that really stand out to me. Yeah, as they're like these, a classic cars or you know versus you yeah, know performance yeah, yeah. cars. They have yeah. these really distinct. I actually had like an, I had a discussion, a very civil discussion with one of my friends because um, he was talking about the new um, the new uh, Call of Duty or Battlefield Vanguard Call of Duty Vanguard. Which one is it? Who the that? hell knows at this point? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever new shooter is going back to World War II again, and I was talking about how much I really like World War II aesthetics on guns because they're you know they're a lot of them are so distinct versus mm -hmm. like like I, I feel I feel like because this is probably just because I'm not a gun aficionado, but when you get to the point where it's like, oops, all AR builds, uh, like yeah. everything kind of starts to run together, and it's like why do you choose one gun over the other if it's not purely just for stats, you know, like and and so it was funny because of this this disagreement. I I prefer a, a loadout like like cultic you know where it's like mm. you have guns that are distinct and have utility so you know like i am an x situation i need to use y gun whereas my friend he's like no the more guns the better like i even if the guns all do the same thing i want to have a ton of them to pick from and mm. it's like that's and it, that's probably explains why the market for skins in in gun in games that have like yeah, microtransactions works so well yeah it, it, which which is totally fine like variety is the spice of life but i also i also subscribe to the theory of you know like, i don't want you know it's like the what it like uh why does a, why does notion deep as a puddle kind of thing or shallow as mm -hmm. a puddle yeah, yeah, where yeah. It's, like, it's like having a lot of content but then like the content is all samey or, or not very deep um, isn't as isn't as meaningful to me as yeah. like a smaller i wonder arsenal. if the reason why the world war ii you know guns work that way and that there's such a great distinction is literally because you had national armories making those weapons. So you had like right. the British making their own weapons, the Germans making their own weapons, the Russians making their own weapons, the Americans all making their own weapons. And you didn't have, this was pre-globalization to a degree. So you'd have these individual companies making these individually styled weapons. And there wasn't that much exchange in terms of, you know, uh, information to design between different places. So each national army had their own specific kinds of guns. And then when they meet each other, you get that contrast of different aesthetics that uh, start, you know, shooting at each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I think a lot of it's just the wood furniture. I don't know why it just gets me. <laughs> I really like it, but uh, that's, that's why we have the Sten Mark V instead of the infinitely more accessible uh, grease gun or earlier, you know, earlier models. Yeah. Oh, hey, I'm not complaining. That thing, you know, kicks ass in the game. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been I've been trying to get every single gun in Coltic, obviously, except for the China Lake, because that's not going to happen. But I want to get uh, like either either a real one if they're legal or a replica one if they're not. Yeah, so, like, grenade got... launchers tend to be a little bit less accessible than most other weapons. Well, especially the China Lake, where there's like well, what less than a thousand of them in existence. Yeah, right? they're a very go. small number. Oh, then but again, so, like, you know, I... up here I've got a. Uh, you have uh, you know the gun aficionado in a certain degree and me it's blades mostly do you know i'm a big sword and sorcery nut and you know ex-military nice. to agree but i've got nice. a 1881 british pattern rifle bayonet up there nice yeah for some reason i found it in an antique shop for 60 bucks just so is that a good price for one of those it is a very good price for one of those so they stopped nice. making them after the world war one because basically they went against the geneva convention Ah, turns well, out, there you go. It turns out those long it's one of those long ones with the triangular blade, kind of like, you know, polygonal, okay. triangular uh -huh. polygon. Yeah. The problem with those, well, problem, the reason people complained about them is that when you get stabbed with through the guts with one of those things, the wound doesn't close up properly because of the shape of the blade, which increases the chances of infection and, you know, sepsis. And then you, it's just nobody's, nobody's enjoying that. So, so you've got a war crime upstairs is what you're telling me. Oh, no, no, no. I have a war crime on my shelf. Oh, okay. 
When you when you pointed up, I wasn't sure uh, in where that was going exactly. <laughs> no, no, I keep all the war crimes down here. That's fair. That's a good call. <laughs> yeah, I found there's a there's an, an airsoft uh, company that makes a really slick looking Mark V, but mm. it's also very expensive, and uh, mm. I eventually have to stop spending money on guns. So yeah, I've got uh, friends who's into yeah, I've got friends who's into airsoft, and it's like I can't no, I can't. I, I might as well get into Warhammer miniatures if you want me to spend that much money. Yeah. It's there, but it's cheaper than an actual Sten Mark V by a long shot. So that's that's where that comes from. But maybe maybe I'll just have to settle for playing with the cultic loadout in hot dogs, horseshoes, and hand grenades because that's oh, that's also go. fun. Yeah, that's a VR game, right? It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh man, I cannot imagine playing that. Trying to redo do the actual motions. I'm assuming it's one of those games where you have to do the full everything with the gun that you can do in yep. real life. Try to do that with. Uh, vr controllers it just seems like i'm assuming it works because you know the game's probably pretty popular but yeah i just cannot imagine how that would work with already having something in your hands the funnier thing i mean yeah obviously like it's weird it's different without all the physical feedback but the 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 the, the part that everyone overlooks the better part about it is like when you have friends over to try out your vr headset and like you've got so you've got the vr mirrored to the tv so like you're all sitting on the couch watching while somebody else plays and to them like in in the headset they're in the middle of this intense firefight like they're getting shot at they're crouched behind a wall they've got a shotgun and they're they're throwing shells in the shotgun and it's this really intense moment outside of the headset all you see (laughs) all you see is one of your friends standing there like a jackass going like this with his controllers together and like just kind of like crouched down on the floor of the headset it's just really funny just it's the same thing for like uh like like surgeon simulator you know you're playing okay, that, that is VR, more well like, spent then yeah it's, it's like in vr it's like it's this you know you're really immersed in it and it's this very immersive like experience you're really engrossed in but then everyone who's watching you play you're just like standing there with a headset on and so it's just it's a really funny like it's just a really funny like disparity between the two yeah oh boy so do you think you have the current loadout for cultic kind of you know set in stone right now i know you added just added uh, the uh started the design work for molotovs and stuff like that you're intending on adding more incendiary style weapons or is you pretty much set on what you have uh, currently um so there's probably going to be a couple more weapons at least um nothing is the the current the current uh loadout is is, is set in stone all that stuff is staying mm-hmm. um but i've been considering adding a proper scoped rifle for actual like because like I wasn't originally intending on doing anything like that because I didn't think Cultic would have that many long range encounters. But then my demo was chock full of long range encounters. (laughs) And so I'm like, well, maybe a scoped weapon would be kind of cool. And if I add a scoped weapon, the caliber of round you'd have to use for that would also open up the possibility of having like, you know, light machine guns or battle rifles. And so you you could do you could do maybe like a little 30 out six action, maybe have a Browning's automatic in there. Like those are all options. Nice. Um but as far as incendiary stuff goes, it's going to depend on how fire feels in combat. Like if, mm-hmm. if it's like a, if it's like a thing that once I get it rolling, that like I want more fire weapons, I want to light more people on fire in cultic. Um, then then yeah, I'll probably try to. I mean, like I think that like incendiary shells for the China League is a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe. Beat. Yeah, maybe like some like maybe some incendiary rounds for the other guns. I'm not really sure. Like. But the problem is, like, I don't want to distract from the utility of each gun either. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of a balance of, like, I, like when you pull up in your weapon wheel, you should know exactly what gun you're going to grab for the situation that you're in. And I don't want to add to that with, like, which gun do I want and what ammo type is in it right now. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to overcomplicate things in that regard. Yeah. And so, like, the incendiary rounds for, like, the China Lake could be an easy alt fire, not a thing that you have to swap out. But the more that you add incendiary types of ammo, it's like, okay, do I need to add a complete like alternate ammo system where you can hit a button to like Mm -hmm. dump your mag and then put a new one in um or you know so that's just a decision that needs to be made and that adds a whole nother level because if every single gun's going to have incendiary ammo then enemies need to be a little deeper in how they respond to it there's going to be enemies that that are that are weak to fire that are you know that are weaker to fire rounds and and which is which is fine like that's something you could have enemies that start using fire rounds Oh yeah, I'm sure everybody would love that. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, everybody love the Hellhounds and Blood. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, for sure. So it's, it's one of those things I have to think about. Like right now, I just want to replace the kind of half baked fire system that I have now with a, like a real one, um, and then we'll we'll have to go from there. Yeah. And then there's and then there's going to have to be some big, uh, like like to hell with everybody in this room kind of gun 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that's gonna have like to a full on flamethrower or something like that. You know, something you just yeah. empty out a whole trench of enemies with. Yeah. So I've got I've got to have some kind of BFG in the game, but I'm not yeah. I'm not sure what it's gonna be just yet. So yeah. that's gonna be, and that's probably something where I can dive into more of like a like a, you know, w- dive into more of like a paranormal, oh, multi- yeah, yeah. arcane kind of thing with that. Uh, but I'm gonna have to decide on that and see what yeah. would, what would like. Fit. So you pick up a actual Necronomicon, open it up, and you've ever played uh, Hexen. I have. Okay, the super weapon for the cleric fires off this whole gaggle of spirits at home in on enemies and tear them limb from limb. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying, but I'm trying to keep it grounded in a way of like, what would this, you know, what what would your character, this like, you know, just grizzled half dead detective what would you be able to pick up and, and make use of yeah and, yeah, I, and yeah. I don't and i don't really want to turn the character into like a like a spell slinging you know like a, a cult yeah he, it's either. not you're not playing someone who can speak latin so right so it's like and so it's kind of going to be like it, it can be like like a maybe a cult weapon like some kind of weapon that's imbued with some kind of energy or mm-hmm. or something like that but i don't want to i don't really want to dive into the realm yeah. of like your your character becoming some kind of like you know magic wielding person yeah. or he picks up some or, kind of artifact that looks like it has a life of its own in a certain way like it's always like maybe it has eyes on it that are staring at you at, at times yeah so it looks like yeah. you're not really in control of it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that would be cool, but I see. I just I don't know. It hasn't to, uh, to be determined. Not really yeah. sure. No, well, you know, fingers crossed. Still hoping for that yeah. flamethrower. That's for sure. <laughs> we'll see. I will. We'll never say never. Yeah, it likes me a good flamethrower. <laughs> so earlier on, you mentioned you know for level design, this is what not one of your strong suits, at least for you know this kind of full three D kind of uh, level uh, kind of thing. What would you say is something that you have a particular amount of difficulty with with regards to that? Um, just in regards to like level design itself or just in the, the whole game altogether? Well, in, t- in terms of level design. Um, I think the biggest thing is like, I think I mentioned earlier that like most of the games I've worked on before were like, like roguelites where I was building mm-hmm. small set pieces and then using like a dungeon generator to stitch mm-hmm. them together. And so the biggest thing has been designing has been like figuring out how to design a contiguous space, like mm-hmm. like I like designing the prison or the the camp or the cave or the the big arena area. Those are all like set pieces, which I don't, which I I feel comfortable with designing. But it's like, how do I how do you chain all of those together? How do you get from one place to the next? How do these how do these set pieces all relate to each other? And right. then how do you and then how do you pace it properly? Like how do you how do you pace it so that the player you know, it doesn't feel like they're slogging through the level, but they also don't feel like the level is over in two minutes either. And so a lot of it was just like kind of figuring out how that balance worked, you know, like the, um, well, I thought you final... did pretty well for the, uh, for the demo itself. Like you're, you start out <clears throat> dealing with that prison, as you say, it's, you know, isolated areas separated by doors. So you're going in, taking out a couple of cultists, move on, take out a couple of cultists, find some secrets moving along. Then you get outdoor areas, it's longer distance. You can spot enemies a little bit further, but you also have trees for cover and stuff and the trucks. Then it's back into the mines for or caves or you know, whatever, I guess mines in this case, where right. you're you know engaging with enemies in close quarters. Then you have, like you're saying, that great big set piece where you have this opener, more open area with catwalks. You take care of that, you're a badass. And then you get to the place with the hanging bodies. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're back in the freaking Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it's, it's funny that you point out like the way that it's uh, all flows together is like the way it's designed is kind of like, like teaching and testing and teaching and testing as mm-hmm. it's like, you know, the player, the player gets the mass grave area to learn how to walk and run and jump. Um, there's a little secret right, right there. First thing, like, if you're like, oh, I wonder if I can jump on this truck and then jump up on this ledge, you know? Yeah. So it's, so players who immediately want to test out their movement are rewarded for that. And then if you're playing on a normal difficulty, normal or hard, um, then all you get are just a few axe cultists at first. You get and so you you're you're forced to deal with like one cultist with your melee weapon. So you get the hang of that. And mm-hmm. then you immediately get handed a handgun. You're like, here you go. All right, now you yeah. can shoot. And then it's like, okay, but here's an enemy that can shoot back. And so while you're in the prison, you get a taste of what it's like, like how enemies move, how they how they attack, but you're in a closed off area. You don't have enemies shooting you from blind corners, you don't have enemies shooting you from the distance. And then you get out to the parking lot and that's your first like test. Like you, 
you either open up the garage door or you start above everybody with cover. Yeah, yeah. So you have the you have the advantage in that firefight. Which shows Assuming, you that there are different ways of approaching fights depending right. on your approach. If you want to go up, go down, take out different, use different weapons, use different tactics. Right. So like you get the opportunity there to like if you're coming in from the garage, you can use that as a choke point and you can put dynamite down. If you're coming from the stairs, then you can throw a, a bundle down and blow up half of the cultists in that area with one explosion before mm -hmm. you even before anybody even knows you're there. And then and then you start and then you get like a small taste of like long range combat where you've got cultists with pistols and then cultists with axes that are off in the distance, but it's still a very like linear open area. So you don't you know, you're not really getting like blindsided or anything. Um, and then you kind of work your way up into the cliffs and into the camp and you get the lever action and you get the shotgun and you get enemies that are placed in areas. You've got like Sten cultists that are standing in areas that are a little further away that you need to put down quickly. And then the arena, like the big arena with all the catwalks is kind of like the big test of the level. Yeah. Like how well have you figured out how to duck and dodge and throw dynamite and 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 prioritize targets and notice- and That's when, when you really bring in the shotgun cultists who have like multiple different modes of attack. So up close, they right. smack you in the face. Up further away, they throw dynamite at you. And if you're right in the sweet spot, bang. Yeah. Yeah, and but it's like if you're playing on extreme for people who have already played the game once or don't really care to have you know easing in the difficulty, the first room you walk into has like five cultists in it, and there's two pistol cultists ready for you. And then as soon as you get into the parking lot, there's a guy with a sten on top of the truck who can immediately start shooting you. And so it's like, and so that learning curve also has room for you don't want to learn. Well, you're okay. Well, then have fun. Like you're still, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not going to be a cakewalk for those who just want to sprint through on extreme. And, but then the fun thing with the, um, you know, like you said, you go through this arena, you fight all these enemies, you got the music going, you rack up 40, 50 kills in there, and then you're dropped into the harvesters layer. And now you don't know what to do because suddenly you've got these bodies in the ceiling that you can't kill. You know, like you can shoot them all you want, but they don't die. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you, okay, well now there's bear traps on the ground. There's corpses hanging from the ceiling and, and the music got really creepy. And then you grab a key and then the door closes and then you hear a chainsaw and you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> and, and that was actually funny. It's the, my inspiration for setting that encounter up was, uh, uh, there's a game called Cry of Fear, which is like a, it's like a, a Half-Life mod, but like yeah. a total conversion. And it's yeah. one of my favorite horror games of all time because it's, it's done so well, but there's a part. Um, where you're kind of walking around in these underground like metro tunnels and it's very tight, very claustrophobic, very maze-like. But while you're down there, you keep hearing like a chainsaw revving up in the distance and getting closer. And oh, you're God. like, you're and, and you're freaking out because like you're 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 lost. It's dark, it's like cramped corridors. So if you round the corner and there's a chainsaw, you're gonna die. But the funny thing is there's nobody down there with a chainsaw. There's no enemies. And so like oh, it's boy. it's just it's it's one big fake out. And so it's like the <laughs> and so it's like the player like they, like their, their mind gets the best of them. And, and yeah. so like maybe you hunker down and you can you wait for them to come to you or maybe you try to sprint out of there because you're panicking. And so it's, it's like, so you, if you grab the key, you hear the boxes fall over blocking your escape. And then you start to hear the bodies drop. And it's like, you know, some, and it's, it's my favorite part of watching anybody stream cultic. And sometimes the reason that I join the streams is to watch <laughs> how they, how they handle this part. And, and it's, it's fun because some people like, they're like, nope, they're just going to hide in that back room and they're going to wait for the, the harvested to come to them and pick them off. And then, and then they hear the chainsaw and they're like, well, I'm just going to wait back here. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to hide. And some people are like, nope, I'm out of here. And so they blow the door open and they sprint out only to be met with a guy with a chainsaw <laughs> who, who and it's like, okay, well now yeah. you've run headlong into a guy with a chainsaw and behind you are bear traps and the harvested are wriggling around back there. Yeah. And so it's just one of those things that like, it, it, it just creates like so many different types of encounters depending on what kind of gamer you are. Um, and, and one funny thing that I didn't even think would be a possibility is like, if you, if you're back in the room that has the key and you fire a gun back there, it's actually close enough to the harvester that it, uh, that it, it, it turn it like activates his AI. Yeah. And so he'll hit. And so he will actually come to you if you wake him up. Um, and that's, and so I was, I had never seen that happen before until I watched somebody stream. And so they're like hanging out in that back room. And then the harvester walks through the door and I was like, he's not Ooh. supposed to be back there. And, and that's kind of their reaction too. And then, you know, they're stuck in this tiny room with a guy with a chainsaw oh, boy. And, I, and the harvester's not that big of a challenge. Like he doesn't have all that much health, but it's just one of those things. Like if he catches you once, you're probably going to die. Like the chainsaw yeah, yeah. does a crazy Especially amount of Especially on the damage. higher damage difficulties.
Yeah. How do you manage to balance for higher difficulties? Like you mentioned, like the enemy uh, composition changes and stuff like that. What other changes happen uh, specifically to higher difficulty levels compared to the lower ones? So, so the basics, um, just like as, as you mentioned, there's there's more enemies on higher difficulties, and not only not just like quantities of enemies, but enemies are placed in a, in areas that provide more unique challenges. So like mm -hmm. like like I mentioned before, if you're on very hard or extreme, when you first walk out into that parking lot, there's a Sten cultist on top of the semi truck who immediately sees you, and so like and so like that makes it so that encounter is much harder to do stealthily because like as soon as you walk out there, yeah. you, you, you the encounter starts. It's like you've played um, through that on the lower. Difficulty difficulties you think okay i'm gonna sneak up this way throw some dynamite down there take out the whole bunch and then you do it on extreme just because you think you're hard enough and oh yeah, and yeah he's got the stun right there um and so enemy placement and enemy count is higher on higher difficulties um enemies uh some other attacks change a little bit like mm -hmm. the the shotgun cultist throws dynamite uh sticks it's which is straight out of blood so i'm not, oh, I'm not yeah. taking credit for that one but they throw sticks on lower difficulties and entire bundles on higher difficulties um <laughs> the amount the amount of time they wait between raising their weapon and playing their telegraph sound and actually firing is much much shorter so like on on casual the easiest difficulty when you raise your when like the sten cultist raises his gun you have like almost a full second to get into cover before you start shooting but on extreme it's like a quarter of a second so like as soon as you hear the gun raise you need to get down and move yeah um and so like the reaction time and the amount of time they wait before shooting and then there's other little things like the pistol cultist fires more shots per volley on higher difficulties mm -hmm. so like on on like easy he only fires like two rounds and so like even if you get hit by both you're not going to die yeah. but on extreme he fires five times and he does it like you will die if you get hit by all of those bullets. Yeah. Um, and then just like they have higher health, um, but uh, like headshots and stuff are balanced to do enough damage so that like getting a headshot with a lever action should always kill a cultist no matter what difficulty you're mm -hmm. on. Um, and then I'm working on trying to balance explosions to do the same thing. Yeah. Because um, like dynamite doesn't feel as satisfying as it should on extreme just because enemies have such a high health pool, like especially like the shotgun guys have so much yeah. health. Um, but a stick of dynamite to the face should still they should still die. So, so that's going to be something I need to balance a little, excuse me, something no I need problem. to balance a little more. Um, it's just like making explosions feel better on higher difficulties um, because I don't want enemies to just feel spongy. Like I don't feel like that's a good kind of difficulty. Yeah. <coughs> My turn. <coughs> <laughs> well, I did bring the get be prepared. Uh, this reminds me actually of how they did uh, difficulty for the stalker games. Uh, I was just the about first to bring one. that up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? How at easier difficulties, you're a bullet sponge, but so are the enemies, but the yeah. harder and harder you make it, everybody turns into a, pretty much a one hit kill for any weapon at a certain point. Yeah. So, you know, it keeps that same level of like, it's harder for you to play, but you still have that, you know, innate fun factor of just being able to gun down enemies just as easily as they can gun you down. Right. Well, and it's like in Stalker, like if you're playing the game stealthily, then playing on hard is like easier because it's like, you know, because yeah. like before, if, if you get a headshot with a pistol on, on easy, it, it doesn't matter. It does like no damage. Yeah. But if you if you're playing on the hardest difficulty, then like if you can sneak a headshot then on a bandit, it's it's actually going to be effective. And exactly. so I remember the first the first time I played it, one of my friends who is much more. Uh, into stalker than I am I was like oh just play on the hardest difficulty and I was like I don't think I'm going to do that and he's like mm, no you probably you just trust me so I was like yeah. oh okay it's one of those rare games where you really should start higher level difficulty than you normally would if you're just starting out just to get that satisfaction to it especially if you're more experienced with first person shooters and you know don't need to learn as you're going for that regard right and it's like it's it's one of those things where like you said, it, like everybody on a hard on a harder difficulty, like everybody's fragile. Like like it's just it's not so much that enemies are now sponges; it's that attacks do more damage all over the place. Yeah. Um. But it's but it's not quite to stalker levels. The enemies do still get health boosts, but playing playing in a smart way, you know, it's just, it's just like you just have to be smarter about headshots. You have to be smarter about using explosives. You can't just go in shooting enemies in the body with the pistol and, and yeah. expect to have the same results. And that's you gotta something be able that, to, you know, keep those exploding barrels and use them as projectiles too. toss them into an enemy camp and shoot the barrel to detonate everybody around you when you don't have dynamite. 
Right. Which is like one of, one of the most fun things. I think the first time I was like testing out the extreme difficulty was like, I was like, I'm just going to do like a melee run. Like, and that was when I was, when I was sharing it with my friends for play testing, it was like, I was like, it, like, if you, if you get through the game and you enjoy it, try doing a melee run on extreme, just like, like hatchets and thrown objects only. Like you can pick up, you can pick up barrels and stuff, but like no guns, no guns, no dynamite. And like, everybody like really really enjoyed that it's because it's just like such a unique challenge because there's so much stuff in the environment you can use so it's like suddenly all of those chairs and barrels and lanterns mm -hmm. become really really useful um and hopefully more so once i get the fire system kind of kind of oh, ironed yeah. out uh, but it's just it's not it's not just like enemies have more health so you have to shoot them with a the shotgun more times it's like you really need to prioritize your headshots and you really need to use those barrels and you really need to use fire and 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 cover to your advantage um, and so it's just, you know, stuff like that, that's, uh, all gone into kind of making the difficulties a little more, a little more like just in depth than just like enemies now have double health and that's all that, you know, hard is. Yeah. Well, one of the other ways, of course, that, you know, especially in these, this style of shooter, of course, that, you know, helps to circumvent, circumvent that level of difficulty is, you know, secret hunting. And so one of the things I liked about uh, demos that, one, there's a lot of different secrets, and also you have different levels of secrets, so to speak. So, you know, some of them are easier to find than others. You mentioned the one at the start where you jump on the hood of the truck, jump on the ledge and find, you know, a little vent there. But there's another one right opposite to that that I missed the first time I went through because, yep. yeah, because there it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a cracked wall there you could blow up with dynamite, classic build engine fashion, except, you know, you're not going to think of that if you're at the first time unless you're way better secret hunting than I ever am. And well, see, that's the fun thing. That's the fun thing where like the environmental hints come into play because like yeah. every, for the most part, most of the secrets in the game that I'm, I'm trying to think about now, they all have like clues as to their location. So like e even, even the super duper duper secret, which I'm not going to spoil for anybody in case they haven't found it, <laughs> has like a fairly subtle giveaway, like showing where it is. Yeah. Um, but, the, but like, so the, the armory secret where you get the grenade launcher, um, if you go inside to the garage and you go up the stairs, there's a locked or a locked door and there's a, a sign, a big sign that says armory that right there. And so people see it and like armory, I want to go in there. I like armories, but, but then the door won't open. And so they're like, okay, well, how do I mean, there's this giant sign. So like clearly armory is important. And so then you try to find a way around and what's on the opposite side of that. But, a wall that has a big crack in it and so it's one of those things that like it's it's like it's not like blatantly being like like here's the secret but it's yeah. like i need to find another way into this room so let's see like what's on the opposite side of the wall from here and you're like oh there's a ledge that i can walk on oh i bet i can jump over that gap and then here you oh, are yeah. in front of this cracked yeah. wall. i did like the fact that you introduced the idea of cracked walls like there's one secret that's kind of easy to find because there's you know, a little tooltip saying you know hey certain walls can be broken with explosives so you know you do that okay I wonder if there's any other places that I missed that had that. And then you can start looking around and, oh, there's one and, you know, go from there. I also like the fact that you can kick open doors. That was pretty yeah. cool too. Just being able to breach into a room, just gun down everybody with a stand is fun. So. Yeah. And it's, it's also going to be a really fun speed running thing, I think too. Cause like if you, if you jump kick, you can like get through a door without losing much momentum. And so I think people timing their like jump kicks on doors is going to be fun. I also but... think you can kick off enemies heads too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it uh, it counts as a bullet headshot, so it splatters their head instead of knocking it off like a decap does. But I think being able to kick the head off would be more fun, so I should probably switch that around. Yeah, I don't uh, know. You know, it's nice blunt force trauma. Making someone's skull turn into confetti is pretty good too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can so you can certainly target the head with with kicks and and get a knife. You can also punch heads off with the fists, but. Um, I feel, I feel like I need to, one of the fun things about the fist is they don't do nearly as much damage as the hatchet, but mm -hmm. they're faster. And you can like, like if you do, if you just rapidly punch and alternate kicks, you can just like bicycle kick people into walls so they can't <laughs> react. And it's, it's honestly really fun when you have like one ax cultist to just like, you're just like, like punching him as fast as you can, but then also like kicking him with your leg. And it's, it's almost like, like, you know, Duke Nukem levels of dual, oh dual mighty boots of just like stun locking this guy into the wall. And you almost feel uh, bad for him at the end of it. At some point, we're going to see the face of our main character and it's going to be Bruce Lee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. But, but the fists are also just like, you know, your guy's not like a hand to hand combat expert. So it's really like a, a last ditch, yeah. uh, a last ditch effort. Um, if you don't have anything else, but I'm sure eventually someone's going to do an unarmed run of cold. Yeah. And I want that to oh, be a God. viable, I want that to be a viable thing. I want, yeah. I forget, is it run. possible? I forget. Is it possible to throw your last hatchet? I know you can have yeah. multiple. No. Okay. Yeah. That's no, why I figured. Can't. 
You, you're forced to keep your last hatchet. Mm. Well, you know, <laughs> these things happen. Yeah. yeah, I just, I don't know. I it, Originally, you could throw it, uh, throw your last one, but it's like the the hatchet is such like a quintessential part of the yeah. of the of your inventory, and having a good melee weapon as a backup for when you're out of ammo is so important to like the design of the game that I didn't want players to like accidentally mm. throw their last hatchet and not be able to find it, and then be in a situation where they no longer have a good melee weapon. Plus, it's uh, important to yeah. have your iconic melee weapon, you know, on you for your character. Freeman's guy's crowbar, the cultic uh, detective's guy's hatchet. It's just you know right. how it works. And I think the hatchet, I, I really want the hatchet to kind of become not not necessarily like Half-Life levels of iconic crowbar, but like the hatchet has such like strong imagery in like the intro, for example, like that final shot of the intro where the axe is like this foreboding thing of like what, you know, what takes your character down. But then it's also the first thing you use to retaliate against the cult. So it's kind of like, it's got this like interesting, like, sim I don't know, like symbolism, but like yeah. position in the game where it's like, it's like your guy gets killed by a hatchet. And the first thing he does is grabs a hatchet and and starts wailing on the on the cult. As of uh, now, I'm thinking the first cultist you kill is the guy who put that hatchet in you in the first place. There's actually there's actually like a funny a funny bit of lore about it that I'm not going to spoil now, but um, kind of like a, a funny thing about like why the hatchet is there in the first place in the in that stump. So mm -hmm. I'm not really sure how I'm going to tell that story, but um, it's something that would probably need like text logs or something. Mm. But it's uh, there, there's a funny there's a funny little a piece of lore behind why that axe is there that I think people will, might maybe enjoy hmm. well we'll see about that i certainly hope to find out at some point with the game kind of finally comes out so let's see regarding yeah back to secrets for a second how hard is it to actually gauge how much to put into those you know in terms of loot uh, pickups and you know power-ups and stuff like that put into those versus how hard to make to make them findable so to speak because you know the one of the worst things with some sometimes in games when you have this kind of secrets uh from, that you have to find is you find one that's really hard and it turns out it's just like a little health pickup or something like that and it's just like this doesn't feel worth your time so how do you find yourself balancing that uh, aspect of those so it's kind of uh <laughs> they're not very balanced right now if i'm being honest if you find every secret in the demo you can finish the demo with like 400 handgun rounds and like 70 shotgun shells it's a lot um but it's mainly just about like what I want the player to have at that point in the level. Mm. It's it's like like when you get to the parking lot. Uh, so like like for example, in the final game, the grenade launcher is not going to be in the first level. Yeah, it's I not figured be something much. that you get. And so yeah, he kind of makes the harvester do you know it's chunky yeah. salsa very easily. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's so it's like by the time you get out to the parking lot, like if you've if you've checked behind the toilets, then you'll have a lever action at that point. You can survive the parking lot without the lever action super easily, but having the lever action is really, really nice at that point because oh, yeah. it makes picking off those distant enemies a lot easier. And so it's one of those things that like, um, like what would it be nice for the player to have here, but wouldn't be like game breaking for them to have right here. Yeah. Um, and that's so like the China Lake was in the, it was in the first level just because I wanted people to be able to play with it. Um, it's definitely not going to be in the final game in the first level of the final game. Yeah. Um, but it's just like, you know, and so it's part of the challenge right now is there's not a whole lot of items in the game. So like the only way I can reward players right now is like health or ammo. Yeah. And that's going that's going to change eventually when I have, you know, like there's another armor type I'm wanting to add. There's like weapon upgrades that I'm wanting to do that you'll need oh. to have upgrade parts for. And oh, I that think, sounds cool. And I think there's probably going to be a little bit of an economy in the game. So the player can find, will be able to find, I think, money as well. Uh, which is going to play into uh, it's going to I've got I've got some very Resident Evil Four things I want to oh. do with a bit of an economy. So <laughs> that's going to be fun. Um, so just uh, so I think there's going to be a lot more in terms of rewarding the players soon. So instead of it being like, okay, do I get health or bullets? Health or bullets? You'll be like, oh, this is a treasure trove of cash, or like, oh, this is like like there. It's going to be one of those things like um, like I don't know if you ever played like Mega Man X, um, but like oh, like wow, the. Man the the big tantalizing like health upgrades and the and the e tank upgrades where it's just like that's what you want to see like mm -hmm. sure finding a finding a secret with health with health restoration is cool but like when you see that that energy tank just hiding up there you're like yeah. i have to get that and so being able to tantalize the player with like like the weapon upgrades which are going to be like a super valuable resource is going to make like secret hunting a lot yeah. more fun i think and then and then just um 
things like, you know, if I do like side game modes, being able to unlock stuff for those or being able to unlock achievements and, or, you know, being able to put stuff like that in secrets as fun yeah. bonuses will be too. Or but. just like, you know, little reference, like, you know, finding the protagonist of some other game dead and strung up in a secret area. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll have to see if uh, maybe, you know, I've got this, this, this company that's, that's <laughs> publishing the game. Maybe, maybe they have, a, maybe they have some stuff they'd like to find featured in there, but that's something I, I really know. have a lot. I have a lot of game developer friends that I'm just like, I'm, I'm like, all I want to do is like put a cameo to one of your characters in my <laughs> game because, because I know how cool it is um, to like, to be, to like have somebody make fan art of your character or be like, oh man, like, uh, like it's, it's really cool to just see somebody else appreciating something that you've made. And so I, and I feel like those cameos are such like an easy nod to do that. Yeah. Um, and so that's something I really want. I'm really looking forward to doing when I have more than one level to do it in. Oh uh, Yeah. Whew, man, that is going to be so much fun. <laughs> I got to say, when I first came across this game, I was like, oh, so this is where Blood 2 has been all this time. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't say it. I, I'm very, I try to be very careful about comparing Cultic to Blood, aside yeah. from just saying that like, it is inspired by Blood, because oh, yeah. it's, it's a very different game, and I don't, I don't ever want people... Well, it's, it's obviously cool to see people saying, like, oh, like this is the Blood 2 we never got. Like, I don't... I don't want to necessarily say yeah. that I'm filling those shoes because like it's because blood is a very special place in, in my, in my, uh, mm. my library, you know, it's yeah, one of my favorite too. games I played growing up. And that's the way it is for a lot of people. A lot of people have just, it's one, it's just like, it has such a, a such a big following behind it. And I, I don't want to be that guy that's like, Oh, I'm making the next. Oh, blood, yeah, yeah. You know? And so like, and so like, I say that like, it's blood inspired. And I think the people who enjoy blood will enjoy this. Yeah. And I, and I try to take things that made blood good and incorporate them into my game. But Coltic is also its own game. And so there are a lot of battles that I do that I do fight back on. Like, you know, like a lot of people want like dynamite to blow up on contact. And like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I compromised. I, I went the fear route where if you get a direct hit with a dynamite, it will blow up. But like dynamite's supposed to be a utility. If you want exactly, contact yeah. explosives, that's what the China leak is for. I don't want to mix those two up. Um and so there's stuff like that and like the yeah. art style uh, that I that I'm like these are things that I want to be unique about Cultic. They're part of my vision for the game. Yeah. And so like and so like it's it's not it's not blood. And so when so, sometimes when people uh, complain about something about the game, saying like, well, it was like this and blood, I'm like, well, like respectfully, then like play blood. Like if that's what you like about blood, then play blood. There like that's go. not what this game is. This yeah. is a game that this is a game that you should enjoy if you enjoyed blood. But it is not. It's not replacing it. I'm not releasing blood remastered. You know, that's not which was exactly. Sick. Yeah. Let's let's maybe make that happen. But, um, but who knows? Like, that's uh, that's it. May, maybe Cultic will will be an inspiration enough that somebody out there who happens to be an IP holder for blood will will decide to to do something with it. Mm -hmm. um, but we can only hope. We can only hope. Well, you've certainly managed to set it apart, at least not just in terms of tone, but also in terms of like, you know, gameplay mechanics like that. You've already, you know, like di the idea of turning dynamite into cluster bombs by removing the wrapping on the bundle is inspired, by the way. Like, I yeah, just, you know, like at first I wasn't doing it that much, you know, just because, you know, using the middle mouse buttons doesn't, you know, didn't come to me at a, during the middle of a firefight. But then I just started doing it. And it's like, oh, this is good. Like during the, uh, that, uh, huge you know, battle in the mine shaft with the huge open area you got the music uh -huh. pumping and i'm up there on top it got you know pistol cult is down there shooting at me if there's a shotgun cult is right there rip toss and a bun sticks of dynamite go all over the place and there are explosive barrels down there so it's just yeah. massive explosions and then i just, just rushing in with the shotgun out and just going into town and it is just glorious yeah it's it's an interesting experiment because like the 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 cluster bomb doesn't do well it does as much damage as a bundle of dynamite collectively but obviously since it's spread out it's not as much focused one area so you know, like if you throw a bundle of dynamite at a cultist they're going to die if you throw a cluster bomb towards a cultist they probably won't die but it softens up not only does it a soften up the entire crowd but it also touches it creates those chain reactions which is exactly the really fun part. which is the, it's, really really fun yeah, it's like this cluster bomb. Not only it, it's it's gonna it knocks axes out of the air, it detonates cultist TNT prematurely, it sets off lanterns, it sets off barrels, and it softens the entire crowd up. And then you can take them down much easier with the stand or whatever else. Oh, yeah. And so it's, it's it's just an interesting utility, and that's why it's an alt fire, you know, or a tertiary fire in this case. But it's just like uh, 
it's just it's <laughs> it was inspired to me by the uh, Far Cry 5's cluster rockets are just like they're just like I don't use them super often because they're they're hard to use from like a like a utility standpoint, but they're just so satisfying because it's uh -huh. like I, I know that there's like a huge crowd of enemies in here, but um, I'm just going to rain fire on them like that's just what's going to happen right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, they deserve it, frankly. <laughs> uh, yeah, but there's also like other aspects to the game itself, but, like beyond the fact that you've upped the uh, melee combat uh, abilities. Well, oh, your camera just went out. Yeah, I, I got to turn my camera off for just one second. Okay, no problem. Just got to got, got got let some traffic through the through the room here. Ah, okay. But yeah, like beyond the simply, the, you know, you've upgraded the melee combat to something a bit more, you know, feasible. And also, one thing I like is the, the way that you currently have in the current version of the demo, the way the weapons work, the way the items work, the way keys work, it feels a bit more... Um, procedural i guess uh, well not in the you know procedural generation method but it's more like there's a process to things things aren't instantaneous really if you know what i mean right it's not quite full survival horror mode where oftentimes if you even want to shoot something you'd have to hold the button in order to raise the weapon and then you can actually start firing stuff like that which you know has its own particular feel to it but here you're kind of like at a point in between resi 4 and you know an old school first person shooter which i think is where you're aiming for really yeah, it's like it's kind of an interesting mix to handle because it's like the player, the player is is mobile. You know, you don't mm. have tank controls. You're not, you know, like you don't have to stop to shoot. You can slide. You can jump pretty well. You can dodge. Um, but it's also not like full full mobility shooter either. Like you're not, um, you're not like uh, it, it's not it's not like Doom Eternal. Like you're not dashing yeah, yeah. all over the place. You're not um, you're not grappling hooking all over the place. Um, but at the you're same double time, double jumping. Right. Well, uh, not yet, but uh, <laughs> Ooh. I, I don't, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if double jumping is ever going to be a thing. To be totally honest, but um, it is one of my favorite things to have in a game. So, like, if it did happen, I wouldn't be like, like super opposed to it. But, um, but yeah, it's like I try. I'm trying to think of like it's it's more like methodical combat. Like it's yeah. not like survival horror. It's not, um, but it's also not strictly guns blazing. You can do that. It is an option. Uh, especially at lower like, difficulties right but it but it's um i don't know i'm I've, <laughs> i'm trying to come up with a good way to describe it um but you're right it's, it's like it is trying to strike a balance between like survival horror with like the slightly lower ammo count um the fact that like you can manage your field kit for example is kind of like a it's like yeah you, you can, hold it down in order to kill yourself as opposed to using it in one chunk but uh, yeah, it's a and, gradual recovery and that and you can control how much you heal so like mm. if you're like i'm pretty sure i'm about to get a health kit but I also can die in one shot. You can just heal yeah. a little bit. But also, if you're at full health, then like anytime you pick up health, it, it gets goes right into your field. Kit. I noticed that. Yeah. So it's like um, it's kind of like this thing where, um, like I I just I want to. <laughs> I'm really struggling to describe this, but like there there's all these resources that I want the player to be able to use to like to like figure out how they want to approach combat. You don't have to use the field kit if you don't want. Like if you're just going to like barrel through and ignore all of the items in the game, like that's an option. Mm -hmm. It's just like uh, that's like a very dark forces 2 thing. Like you can charge through the game and never use any of the force abilities. You can charge through the game and never use any of the items and just like rely on your guns. Um, it's just like it's entirely up to the way you want to play. And yeah. so it's it's about like building a game around that um but also trying to like ground it a little bit so that things can be a little bit on the tense side like i don't want the player to be a complete superhuman because i don't want things like the harvester encounter to lose any of their any of their like horror any of their edge yeah any yeah. of their horror um but i also you know don't want you to feel helpless either i don't want you to feel like you know i, I don't want you to feel like the player is is moving along at a snail's pace or have that you know mm -hmm. ha have the difficulty be there because you have to stop to aim your gun you know i don't i don't yeah. want that to be where the difficulty comes from or that to be where the tension comes from so yeah um, that it, works it, more it, for it, like a primary horror focus well it's you know really into vulnerability the you know terror elements you know the that particular kind of game that survival horror thing that's where that kind of you know gameplay really shines right yeah, and but it's just like, but I also have a lot of respect for survival horror games, mm -hmm. and I really want to make a survival horror game uh, at some point. Uh, and so that's probably that's probably gonna be because I really love setting up 
uh, like horror set pieces, not like not like jump scare stuff, but just like things like the Harvester's Lair. They're just like you're like, oh, okay, like what's going on down here? What's happening? Like what's what's about to happen? Um, and because it, it's it's always fun watching people play through those and seeing how they handle them and like how effective was this as a scare? Like some people like really really got set on edge down there, and some people oh. just kind of sprint through it and don't really care. So. I remember the first time I went through that thing. First off, I walked into a bear trap. So it's, oh, what, what the ah oh, crap? Bring out the hatchet, smack it off and then start uh -huh. okay smack out this one this one this one i go off i get the key i stuff okay weird music oh shit and then the harvested the you know bundled up corpses come off the ground and i'm like oh what the hell okay and they're not, they're trying to headbutt me with barbed mm -hmm. wire covered faces okay never mind that gun gun i used up a bunch of shotgun rounds on those and then i just walk in and and like I walked right into him and I'm like, oh crap, 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 crap. And I'm backing off. And yeah. he doesn't just have that goddamn chainsaw. He also throws bear traps and nail bombs. Thank you very much for that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things ever to watch is when somebody fights the harvester and they don't notice when he throws a bear trap over their head and they try to back up and they back straight into it. Yeah. Uh, cause, okay, because if you back in, I don't know if you've noticed, but like if you back, if you step in a bear trap that he throws, he like lets out this really creepy laugh and then sprints at you to go I in for a chainsaw that. attack. Yes, I did. I did notice that for the, about the two seconds it happened before I died <sighs> into it. <laughs> Yeah, so stuff There's like that. There's a reason why really... every other play truth in there, I've been saving the China Lake ammo for that guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, but it's, he's also like, once you get past like the shock factor of the whole thing, he's not that tough of an enemy. Mm. And I'm planning the, I'm planning to use him as more of a regular enemy in the future, unless as like a, like a creepy mini boss encounter. So, um, but he's, he's, he's especially like, He's a, he's a big pushover out in the open because he's not very fast, yeah. and so I think he, I think he's going to be really really instrumental in areas where like the player is already feeling claustrophobic and and there's not a lot of room to move around, and yeah. then you've got this you've got this enemy that is hard to stun and hard to stop, and if you get too close to him, like it's it's over. Yeah, and, so and I think he has the ability to reduce your own mobility by putting out those bear traps and forcing right. you to you know get out of cover and stuff with the nail bombs and. You know, he's very much, you know, a well-rounded uh, enemy to face in those kinds of environments. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to situations where I can kind of kind of flex him as a character a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think people will be, you know, no one's really going to be scared of him past the first encounter because that shock factor is over. Like, you know what he does? You know what is, you know, you know, you know that the harvested are pushovers, you know, they're just kind of there to, to be a fodder enemy. Um, and so it's going to be more intelligently using him as an enemy in the future, like finding situations where his AI and his ability set really shines. So, is he usually going to be encountered with the Harvested as well, or is he, you know, going to be appearing on his own like that? I'm not really sure. So um, that would probably be something that if the Harvested are going to appear more often, they're probably going to need a little bit of retweaking mm -hmm. um, because they also only work in very niche situations. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm not really sure. I think that's going to have to be, they're mainly a set piece right now. Um, and I don't really feel like they resonated with too many people as an enemy. Um, they weren't like that. They're not really that exciting to fight or anything. Um, yeah, they're a bit so, limited being, you know, wrapped in a blanket and only able to hit you with their own heads. You know? Right. That between the, that and their, their detonation attack is about the only thing. But I think something that might be kind of fun is I don't, I don't some people didn't notice because they killed them so quickly. But um, if you damage a harvested and then they get close to you, they actually all, they are all outfitted with nail bombs themselves and they will detonate. On the I player. noticed that. Yes. Yes, I did. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm thinking that maybe that also should happen if you light them on fire. And so they're going to, and so like, if they're present, if they're present in an arena, you have to be oh. careful about how you use fire attacks. Do it, do it, do it, do it. So that's, I think that might be something that would make them a lot more fun as like, just like a, a fodder enemy that like, they're not that bad to fight. Unless they get lit on fire and they charge the character and explode, that might oh, that might yeah. make them a little more fun. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, you should definitely do that. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I was thinking. It might be it might be a good plan. Because yeah. then you know, even then, even after you do that, you manage to avoid them coming. You know, keep your distance. Toss one of the Molotovs, light them on fire, back way the fuck away, and have them just show a chain reaction as they blow each other up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking, and it's all nail bombs too. So like, and the nail bombs are like, there is a random spread, but it also spawns a small cluster of nails that go directly for the player. So it's like, you don't, so you don't ever like, you always have to move. You can't get 100% lucky and have everything miss you. Oh boy. That is mean in the best way possible. 
I, I do it the other way around too. The shotgun and the Sten both have the same kind of perk to help the player out. The first, like the first three pellets of the shotgun are like roughly pistol accurate. So like, even if you shoot an enemy from a distance, you're never wasting a shotgun mm -hmm. shell. Like you'll always, you'll always, as long as you're aiming at the enemy, you're always going to hit them with something. And then the Sten is really accurate for the first couple of shots too. So if you do controlled bursts, it's pretty good too. So like huh. there's a lot of, there, there's, there's some little, some little tweaks like that and some little details that, that help help the help the guns more in their utility role to not be like useless if you get caught with your pants down and all you have out is the shotgun you know like if an enemy starts plinking at you from far away and you have the shotgun out if you aim at them you should be able to hit them with enough pellets to at least like stun them even yeah, if so it's you not then get do to cover and, to you know, deal with them with another weapons. weapon yeah yeah oh that's you know damn smart thing to do <laughs> Plus, it's actually pretty accurate. Your first couple of shots with them on any kind of automatic weapon are probably going to be on target. And then after that, you know, the sky's the limit, depending on the recoil. So that yeah. is pretty accurate to my experience with automatic weapons. <laughs> uh, man, that brings me back. Anyway, so I think we've covered pretty much everything that's in the demo. So what's next for you in this case? More the uh, Aside from more levels, more you know, enemies, more story and stuff like that. What are you working on currently? So the fire system, the fire update is what I'm doing right mm -hmm. now. Um, I really want to get that put together because I think that's going to dictate like how how effective and useful fire is, is going to dictate how like encounters are laid out, how the players given weapons, you know, like what enemies go where, more environmental hazards and stuff like that. So something I want to get done really early on. Um, and then there's a little bit more, there's a little bit more optimization work I want to do. And then it's just going to be barreling forward with maps, I think is probably the next big thing. Um, I think I want to get maybe one more map in the hands of the demo players, um, uh, just so that we have a little more to, it's not going to be a full shareware episode, but, yeah. uh, maybe, maybe a couple of levels to run through just to really get, you know, get the feel, get a feel for things. Yeah. Bit of a sample um, pack of different environments, different, you know, environmental hazards, different enemies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the fire update's the big thing right now, and then just a little bit of polishing on internal systems and performance, and then just barreling ahead with content. So that's gonna that was the big thing with getting the enemy redesign done, um, and kind of getting some of these quality of life features that folks were asking for done uh, mm -hmm. right off the bat, um, so I can just start pushing forward with content, and then that way not have all of these extra little things I have to do at the end when I'm ready to get all the levels into people's hands. So that's kind of the plan right now. We'll see how that goes. Well, I cannot wait to get my hands on that and check those things out because <clears throat> from basically just having played the demo a whole bunch of times, you know, streaming it on my, <clears throat> excuse me, streaming it on Twitch and a while back and, you know, playing it before in preparation for this interview, I got to say, if you can maintain the level of quality that we've had so far, you've got yourself a classic on your hands. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping that it's, uh, I'm really hoping that I can keep it as something that that stands out you know that's something that's just like i you know that people enjoy and kind of has that that place in the in their library and in their heart as a as a unique shooter that reminds them of blood and then they just go play blood again yeah or they play blood and all of a sudden you know what i gotta play some cultic i <laughs> every time my my curse now is every time i go back and play blood i try to do the dynamite like i like in cultic Oof. and that so I, every time I go back and forth, I have to like relearn how to use the dynamite. So yeah, yeah. That's, which, which is funny because I get a lot of that from players who are trying cultic for the first it time. It happened like, to me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like and I it throw the bundle, it's, why is it not exploding? Oh, I have to light it first, then throw it. <laughs> yeah. And then when I go back to blood, I do the same thing. I, I light it and then throw it. And well, I guess if you, if you light it first, then uh, it kind of works like the, uh, the way it does in cultic. Because if you light it first, it is a yeah. timed fuse so exactly i guess yeah. i guess it's not that bad but then yeah. i'm just surprised when it doesn't blow up because i'm expecting it to blow up on content. it's always the it's always the small little things that you don't think of uh, at first that really kind of throw you off yeah hmm. yeah pretty much but uh, all right well i've had an excellent time talking to you today is there anything uh any place that everybody can reach you where can they follow you to find out more about cultic i say pretty much pretty much everything i do for cultic is posted on my twitter um at jsaws games so if you want to follow the the development of the project that's the place to be um and then the you know the demos on steam and then there's a cultic channel and the 3d realms discord and a steam discussion board for it if you have feedback um or you just want to talk about the game feel free to do so there i read everything that gets posted 
Um, so I am generally pretty in the loop and try to respond to stuff as I'm able. Um, but yeah, that's tw- Twitter's the big place to go if you want to see more stuff about Cultic. All right, so that is at JSAW's Games. The link is going to be in the description of this very video for everybody who wants to go there. I highly recommend it. He's got some really good little previews of uh, all the stuff he's working on. And I would like to thank you for showing up here. It has been a blast, sir. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to checking out your game as soon as it becomes available. Me too, man. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) All right, well... To everybody who's watching and to, to Jason Smith here of JSAW's Games, developer of Cultic, I say good night. Until next good night. time.